This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Four minutes after 10 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I, I kind of thought this would happen. I thought that the coverage, certainly in the newspapers, um, I thought it would have to be dialed down a little when all of the original claims which were true until they weren't, uh, and, and I mean that quite sincerely, that they were true until they weren't. The idea that Israel's response to the terror attack by Hamas on October the 7th um, was both necessary and retaliatory w- w- was true. And then it crossed to a point where the rationale behind the destruction ceased to apply. You know, people were not prepared. We discovered it live on the program. People were not prepared to say that they were fully supportive of the complete destruction of Gaza. And they were not prepared to say on air they didn't care how many civilians died. There's there's a slight shift. Some people have moved to the point where they're pretending that it's somehow necessary or that it will somehow deliver the eradication of Hamas or, or the release of the hostages, both of which is, I'm afraid, pie in the sky. And, and probably, and certainly in the case of the eradication of Hamas, it was from the start. I Don't, don't laugh, but, I, you know, you watch a film, quite often the origin story of why somebody became a, 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 a um, committed radical or, 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 or rebel or radicalised involves their family being killed by their enemies. It's even Luke Skywalker's origin story, although, of course, it was his uncle and aunt. That, that were killed in the sort of first act of the first Star Wars film. The, the idea that by unleashing this level of carnage upon that um, that population, upon that people, you'd somehow reduce support for or uh, membership of whatever group you want to describe as being dedicated to the destruction of Israel was was always, always ridiculous. And And the crucial point for me, and I'm just an observer, remember, the crucial point for me was when people just stopped actually engaging in good faith. You know, people refused to answer the question of how many deaths would be justifiable, how many civilians need to die before you would say too many, how many people need, how many children need to die before you would say stop now. And, you know, attempts to typify it as a war when since October the 7th, I, I, I don't know what the death toll is in Israel since October the 7th, but I think it's in single figures. So the idea that it's a war in any conventional sense is, is, is palpably absurd. It's a massacre. It's a massacre that some people support because they believe that the lives in Gaza are worthless or they believe that there are no innocent people in Gaza, something which politicians in Israel have said and, and, you know, civilians have said as well. Just think about that. Even if you were born last week, you are not innocent. There are no innocent lives in Gaza. And there are people who perhaps interest me the most, and and I say that with I don't know what I say that with, actually. I, I, I sympathy, heavy heart, well, I don't know. But I say it with some weird emotion inside me. There are people who know that it's wrong and terrible, but actually are also supportive of it because they're so terrified about the existential threat to the, to the country of Israel that is posed by Hamas and, and a, a, a belief that is shared much more widely perhaps in the world than, than many people appreciate, that, that the modern state of Israel has no right to exist. That, that, that's why I find that position most interesting, because it's both cognitively dissonant and yet completely comprehensible. Uh, you can watch what is happening in Gaza with your humanity dialed down, I think, because of that very real uh, and defining part of your personality that sees the modern state of Israel as the only sanctuary on this planet from the sort of ideologies that drove the Holocaust and the pogroms and the centuries of persecution. And, and I wonder why it's so difficult to articulate that out loud. I, I, think, I think it's probably a mark of goodness because somewhere deep down inside you know it's not justified but you're making a calculation based upon history 
and based upon geography and based upon experience. And the calculation is, if it makes me feel safer and my family feel safer for generations to come, then they must die. And that really is where the world or the international community or the United Nations would come in because that kind of calculation is not to be decided by an interested party. You know, the, the, the justification for death for a massacre is supposed to be policed by international treaties. It's what the Geneva Convention is for. The idea that, that the aggressor and Israel is now the aggressor, a provoked aggressor, obviously, and, and completely, but it is now clearly an aggressor. The idea that an aggressor gets to set the terms of engagement completely and, and clearly is just wrong. 18,000 dead, is it? Every building, almost every building destroyed, uh, rendered to, raised to the ground, ne nearly 2 million people, 1.7 million people displaced, no food, no water, fighting over crumbs. Uh, and, I, I, yeah, and, and in response, what do we say? We say Hamas it remains dedicated to the destruction of Israel. Hamas will continue to attack Israelis, attack Jewish people. Um, and, and that's where we are now. And it can't be a very pretty place to be, actually, this knowledge that I'm describing you. And, and I'm sorry for holding up this mirror because it, it's not one I would want to look in. But I know it's wrong now. I know it's a massacre. I know that the, 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 the scale of the killing is unjustifiable. But I can justify it because of the unique nature and status of the modern state of Israel. 03456060973 is the number to call if you'd like to challenge, contribute to, or, or, um, or discuss any of this. Because what happened on Friday was that pretty much the whole world said stop. Stop now. Even the United Kingdom, which, as with uh, America, we, we, we march alongside them on matters of international relations al almost always, and often to our own detriment. The idea that the um, United States has the power to veto a vote passed by every other member of the United Nations Security Council, including three of the permanent ones, albeit it's a strong argument to be made that if you're on the same side of any argument as China and Russia, then you might well be on the wrong side. But you, you, you then look at the 10 elected countries um, that have two-year terms on the Security Council, and all of them voted for a ceasefire. The ceasefire was called for by the Secretary General of the United Nations. See, that, 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 that is the problem with unquestioning support. I, I got told off on Friday for using the word blind, and it's such an entrenched part of national discourse, public discourse, that I, I, I struggle to remember that it may cause offence to, to partially sighted people, and I'll do my best not to use it. So unquestioning support for something breaks everything. If unquestioning support for Israel's right to continue to kill Palestinian civilians breaks international institutions. It, it means that the United Nations Secretary General and the United Nations Security Council got castrated on Friday by an American veto. I read in much coverage, including in Israel, Haaretz report that Biden has given Netanyahu three weeks now. Three weeks more killing, and then you're going to have to step back, man the borders, and mount specific targeted attacks upon remaining Hamas strongholds. Why do we need three more weeks of this? Just to kill more Palestinian civilians, to raise the few buildings left standing to the ground, to reduce the trickle of food and fuel into this hellhole to whatever one down or two down, two gears down from a trickle is. And the United Nations Secretary General and the United Nations Security Council uh, wanted to adopt a resolution that would have demanded an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza, and it was stopped by a, a veto cast by the United States. Um, and, and the United Kingdom abstained the the, 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 the the look the vote would also have demanded that Hamas gives up its 
hostages and and sundry other things that I, I don't know. I still feel, I still feel that we could have had greater expectations of a of a sovereign legal entity like the Israeli government than we could have had of a murderous terrorist group like Hamas. But I, I, everywhere I turn, people are sort of behaving as if one somehow cancels out the other, or the fact that Hamas commits atrocities somehow justifies Israel's breaches of. Uh, moral codes, if not international laws. It's, it's incredible. And America vetoed it. America vetoed it. The, the, just so you're clear, the resolution would have demanded the immediate and unconditional release as well as, of all hostages, as well as ensuring humanitarian access. So even if it didn't happen, because I don't think they have any teeth, they have no powers to impose, their will, but the United Nations Security Council voted almost unanimously... <laughs> for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire and the unconditional release of all hostages and humanitarian access to a population that is starving and traumatised forever. And America vetoed it. Even if America hadn't vetoed it, it wouldn't have happened. It would just have robbed Benjamin Netanyahu of a, a gossamer thin cloak of credibility. The whole world now says no. Even the United Kingdom says, do you mind if we don't get involved in this particular vote? I haven't, I'm afraid, read up yet on, on what the UK's justification for it was. I think it might have been that they didn't feel that there was a sufficient condemnation of Hamas in a resolution calling for a cessation of um, bombardments of Palestinian civilians. So the whole world said stop, and America said, no, you crack on. I don't know what question to ask you. Phones are busy. Um, I, I, I don't think there's much room to challenge what I've said. I, I think the, the position of support for what Israel is doing is either nasty in, in, in the Benjamin Netanyahu position. I, I mean, he's on the record as having said, we, we, we'll wipe them all out when we get the chance. I, I've, I've shared that quote with you a few times. So give him the freedom to have changed his mind, although I don't think he's ever publicly disavowed or disowned those comments, reported by Max Hastings, a former editor of the Daily Telegraph, so not your typical lefty do-gooder by any stretch of the imagination. A large part of Boris Johnson's origin story. But you, you, So you, you've either got that, they deserve to die because they are inferior, they are subhuman, they are scum, and that, that opinion exists in Israel. Or you know it's wrong now, but you have to be both cognizant of how wrong it is and supportive of it continuing because of what the modern state of Israel means to you. I don't, I don't want to sound self-aggrandizing. It's probably too late for that in the great scheme of things, but not today. But why is it so hard for people to articulate that point of view? Not, not necessarily supporters of the continuing massacre, but observers on the outside. Why, why is it so hard for people in my line of work to simply say... It's obviously wrong, but there will be hundreds of thousands of people in Israel who cannot call for it to end because they believe that calling for it to end accelerates a return to or, 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 or catalyzes the well-established desire among millions of people around the world, but particularly in Hamas and, and Hezbollah and neighboring nations, that the, the well-established belief that the modern state of Israel should not exist should not exist. Why is it so hard for that position to be articulated? Got a bit of cognitive dissonance, but goodness me, at least it allows the confused to get their head around what's going on. One question I do have, and, and I'm going to take some of the calls that have come in without me having asked a question, but when, when I have some phone lines free, one question I do have is starting today, not starting on October the 7th or last week or, or, or the week before. But of course you must refer to um, previous days. But starting today, how do you explain to a child what is happening in Gaza? Crucially, I suppose, how do you explain to your child what is happening in Gaza? D David sent me this message several times now. Well, I'll read it out because I don't think he realizes I've already described him. He says, Hamas is the military arm of the Palestinians. The civilians are Hamas families supporting the dis written distraction, but I, I, I'll translate that as destruction. It's called a war. Both sides want their families to live. So 
There, there it is. Uh, it's David, who's currently in London or, or, or in England, supporting the absolute massacre of civilians in Gaza because he, he thinks it's a war. Um, a war which, at the moment, in its current iteration, on, only one side is securing any kills. That's not a war. It's not really a war. In terms of civilian deaths, not, not, not terrorist deaths or soldier deaths, in terms of civilian deaths. And that, that is a position that I have articulated, the belief that they all deserve to die. Everyone in Gaza deserves to die. David will text it, possibly even say it out loud. Most people who can't bring themselves to call for a ceasefire or to condemn the continuing massacre in Gaza, most people know that it's wrong. They, they haven't managed to pretend or convince themselves that it's justified, that a child born last week deserves to die because they somehow support Hamas. But it's the unique state of Israel. The modern state of Israel's unique status in the minds of Jewish people around the world, not just in Israel. That means you can't... I can see it clearly. Why can't you? James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 24 minutes after 10. I'm turning my radio off, as you can see what James's intention is in the programme. He wants to make Israel look bad and guilty. Hamas and its supporters will be eliminated soon, whether someone likes it or not. I, I, I have simply described exactly what has happened. Hamas is absolutely... Uh, I, I don't even have the words to describe that attack on southern Israel. And, I, I, one of, and, and some of the detail that has emerged subsequently. Uh, I, barbarism doesn't even come close. And then I've described what Israel has done since as well. So if you think that makes Israel look bad and guilty, it's not my fault. It's a consequence of the facts that I have shared with you. And, and I've described your position. You're not like David, who thinks that everybody there deserves to die. You, 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 you hate what you're seeing for reasons that you've just accidentally articulated, but you can't call for it to stop because of what you fear a consequence of that would be, and it's a justifiable fear. And my mystery this morning is why so many people find it so hard to tell the truth, which I think I just did. And you find it hard to hear, let alone say it out loud. You can't bear to listen to me say it, even though I come from a position of some sympathy for, for, for where you are. Sarah is in Balham. Sarah, what would you like to say? Hi, morning, James. Hello. Hi, yeah. Um, just to address the um, the question that you posed about how to explain to children. Oh, um, yes. Well, actually, just last night, my son, uh, I was on my phone, and my son looked over my shoulder, and I had to quickly pull my phone away. Um, because I just cannot trust some of the images and the brutal videos that are coming out from Gaza. It would just pop up without warning sometimes. Yeah. And he asked, Mum, why have you lately, why have you not been like allowing me to come near you whenever you're on your phone lately? Right. And why have you been crying when you're on your phone? Um, and so I had to, he knows about Palestine, he knows about the history of Israel and what's happening kind of age appropriate you know he's only yes. eight and i just said well there are people being hurt and there are people being killed i, just, I had to tell him i couldn't shoot coat anymore i oh. said the gardens are being killed and there are children that is why i'm crying and so he said well why don't people stop it mum why don't people stop it and i said people are trying we are all hurt the masses are people in all countries around the world who've been protesting however there are people in power that are not willing to. And he couldn't believe it. And it, it broke my heart to explain it to him like that. And just briefly, just touch upon the existential threat that nobody talks about is the Palestinians. The Palestinians. Yeah. Um, especially the Christian Palestinians who are less than a thousand now left in Gaza. How do you know and they that? Are, I don't, was that before um, the current offensive? This was the 30th of October, Al Jazeera okay. reported on that. And I think they, they use a certain sources, I don't know, on top of my head. Yeah. Um, and we know that the... Uh, and and the do you have links to that community, Sarah? Um, no, it's just very close to my heart. Okay. Um, I, I, since I was 13 years, 12 or 13 years old, and we had Al Jazeera at home, and... Um, the dream of the father who was shielding his son who was sniped. Um, I forgot the name, Mohammed okay. or something. Yeah. And I remember the boy was thirteen and he was shielding his son, same age as me, and an Israeli 
soldier shot him and the son died in his arms and that stayed with me since I was 13 years old. Um, so this, I, I don't know why nobody's talking about the existential threat Palestinians are facing when they are actually being killed in the tens of thousands. And they are people actually are, people are People are talking about it. You just, I think Not you, enough. you object I, I to the vocabulary like, and the tone of the conversation, but... You know, I, 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 I'm specifically talking about the media. So when I'm on social media yeah. and I come off and I switch on to, say, Sky News, BBC, it's as if it's not even happening. The reality is just not reflected. The, the BBC is not doing reflected. a pretty good job, actually. Jeremy Bowen on the ground, least do set. Or, I mean, you can't get into Gaza, which I think is part of the problem you describe. You, you, you literally can't get in. It's almost impossible get in, to get reportage they, out of Gaza. They had on the... On Radio 4, they had an interview, a very, very rare interview with, with with somebody who was still there. It was one of the most harrowing things I've ever read. And it's Israel that, of course, controls access to Gaza mm. for, for foreign they journalists. Have, they have. And I remember when they invaded the north, they um, the, the idea said if, you, if you're going to report, I think CNN, they had to sign some sort of a... Uh, I don't know, a waiver to say that they would allow uh, the Israeli government to, or the IDF to approve everything they report before they publish it. Um, I'm not, I'm not aware of that, so I can't... That was in the north. I've got no reason to doubt you, but, but the, it, the, I mean, I mean, the yeah. fact is we're not getting anything like the sort of reports that we would have got even from Iraq or Syria or, or, or um, Afghanistan. I mean, we don't have embedded people... journalists there. We have, we've had a few cosplaying right-wing columnists from this country sort of um, uh, uh, turning up in flak jackets, uh, staying well away from the trouble and offering up justifications for everything that Israel is doing. But we haven't had a sort of Kate Aidy figure on the ground in, 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 on, in, in the Gaza Strip describing what is happening. So I'm only mentioning that to, to, not to defend mm. journalism per se, but the, the, but but some yeah. outlets are doing their best, but they're doing yeah, their mean, best with one hand. Gone. Hang on, I need to finish this because it, oh, it, it's sorry. quite important for a lot of people listening, not just for you. They're, they're, they're doing their best with one hand tied behind their back. So the reason why you don't, one of the reasons why you don't see the coverage you would ordinarily expect to see if this was happening in the former Yugoslavia, for example, or if this was happening in other Middle Eastern countries where more formal, uh, uh, more accurately described wars were taking place is because the Western media is there with cameras and notebooks and microphones. But it's just not. So that's part of the reason why you're not seeing what you should be seeing. It's not a conscious choice. It's not a bias. It's, it's, it's a handicap uh, uh, imposed mm. by is the Israeli government on journalists who would I, I, because they're weird that way they would love to be there but okay my question then is why do they not utilize the journalists on the ground in gaza that are trapped inside there because well, that is what's being well they do that but they do media. yeah well they do their best but you can't if you you ring me up from balam i can put you on a radio phone in show i can't put you in the news bulletin until i've seen your credentials until i know your background until i've got um I, I, you know prove I, this is only part part of the explanation i, I think there is a bias yeah. In place as well, and I think there is a desperation to keep the true scale of the carnage out of the newspapers. They'd rather put, a, you know, a, 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 a picture of the of, of, of the pr Prince William's daughter wearing the same coat she wore last year on the front so page. Exactly, I saw that, and it, oh my god, it made me shudder. I mean, well, I it, it does make us look like an odd population at the moment because. Uh, you know, if, if, if what Israel is doing is, is justifiable and necessary, then you'd think that they'd want the world to know the full details of it. The pictures that have crept out uh, involve large numbers of men who've been stripped to their underwear, being marched around uh, a camp, like pretty grim pictures. I heard one Israeli spokesman saying they have to do that to make sure they're not wearing suicide vests, to which I think the obvious response is, uh, well, okay, but when you've established they're not wearing a suicide vest, they can put their clothes back on again. And how does taking photographs of them and, and footage of them, which somehow makes its way into the media, how does that guard against the likelihood that they might have been wearing a suicide vest two days ago? It just doesn't. But, but those are the lines that are put out. And, and, you know, also a lot of journalists have died in Gaza already, a lot of journalists, um, but not journalists working for Western organisations because the Western organisations can't get in. 10.32 is the time. Thomas Watts is here with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.36 uh, is the time. I, I think one of the most uh, interesting writers and, and thoughtful writers on the subject is Jonathan Friedland, who 
applies most of his trade in The Guardian. Um, Peter sent me a quote from Friedland, which I, I've got no reason to doubt, um, that, although I haven't got, got the original article in front of me. There's a terrible price to pay as long as Israel keeps fighting in the form of the deaths of thousands of innocents. And there's a terrible price to pay if Israel stops fighting, leaving intact a murderous eliminationist threat. Neither option is bearable. And that, that is, I think, a, a, a close to perfect articulation of the problem. And I think the problem for many people supportive of Israel is that for people without any skin in the game, it becomes logistical and statistical. And, and you struggle to see on one side of the scales, thousands and thousands of deaths continuing, a complete destruction of homes and homelands. And on the other side of the scale, now you see the justification being future deaths, f future theoretical deaths. Now, if, if you're one of the people whose death is future theoretical, and you think that weighs a lot. But if you're not, you don't think it weighs as much as a death that happened then, right then, 20 seconds ago, five minutes ago in Gaza, in the bit that they told Palestinians to go to, to be safe now, the, the, the migration from north to south. Uh, and that, 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 there it is. So I, I get it. I understand it. I have powers of empathy. That, that murderous eliminationist threat evokes future theoretical murders, future theoretical deaths. But on the other side, you are watching in real time massacres of innocent civilians. Of course, I acknowledge, you can shout at your radio, they're not innocent, but you can't pretend that some of them aren't, like the one born then, five seconds ago, five minutes ago. And, and there it is. So how does it end? It ends when Joe Biden decides that enough Palestinian blood has been spilt for him to tell Benjamin Netanyahu who to wind his neck in. It does not end with the eradication of Hamas unless it ends with the eradication of all the Palestinian people in Gaza. Because if you're 15 and you've just lived through this, where, where are you going to go? Loyalty-wise. Um, El Rabi is in Croydon. El Rabi, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello. I want to say that it's very, very difficult to describe or explain this to the children. I have a 16-year-old boy and a 13-year-old girl who are finding it very difficult. They were both kind of supporting Israel in the beginning, yes. and my son still does. He finds it very difficult with friends who are tweeting or Instagramming about um, the Gaza conflict, especially if they are on the Palestinian side. And he doesn't seem to think of how to find a solution. Yeah. It doesn't help that we come from an area of conflict ourselves and being part of the diaspora. Sometimes it helps on your victimization, always finding that, oh, something's happening because it's unfair to you and yes. it's done to hurt you. So he keeps that in mind. And the way that things have done, we can start to find a solution from today, but it will always be rooted in the past because everybody looks backwards. Nobody's looking forwards at the moment. Everybody thinks that they're aggrieved because of this. Somebody yes. else is aggrieved because of that other one. And it's very difficult when you've been fed this, that you are right, that somebody else has done this to you and they're always the enemy. You'll never find a solution like that without trying to better something for both sides. And that's why it's difficult, because better... Well, and and that, those side, voices are almost silent, aren't they, at the moment? Um, well, I mean, they're, they're clearly not silent, but you, you, you call for a ceasefire, you call for the unconditional release of all hostages, um, and you are told that can't happen, even though it is the only precursor to to peace, if you like, to, to, to negotiation. That can't happen because Hamas have made it clear that they will continue to kill at the first opportunity. And that, look, there is an ineluctable logic to that, uh, uh, to that objection, to saying what's the point of a ceasefire as long as Hamas are popping up on the telly every 10 minutes describing that they'll do another October the 7th at the first opportunity. It is, yes, you're right. I've given him, uh, not as an advert this, but... 
there is a writer called Tim Marshall who's written a lot about geography. I know Tim. Both in I know, the I know, I, I, when I I know I Tim. I know Tim well. Um, Prisoners ah. of Geography. It, 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 his, uh, um, and the power of geography. Yeah. Yes. So I've given and divided for where the Balkans was. Yes. Because he was, uh, I think, a journalist in Yugoslavia during that point. He was working um, for Sky, I think. Yes, and uh, I've given my son that just for him to see that sometimes things are so <laughs> interconnected that yes. it is very difficult that... Holding a position doesn't mean that you're 100% right, that there are these areas where there is to be found something else, another solution, that you are not betraying your belief by saying that it's, it's too much now. It has gone too far because I, 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 you are no, feeding I, 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 the I, I, next portion of terrorists well, in a way. I think that's the hardest bit to, to get your head around, the, the idea that, that that is simply not an inevitable consequence of what we're watching now. And I think you've done thoughtful parenting. It must be difficult to to, to, to manage this. Just just out of interest, yeah. what, what, where, 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 where does your son's continuing... Because the need for meaningful response to the events of October the 7th, whether people are comfortable with that or not, about as close to human as you can get, the need for something to be done. There has to be a response. We can't, Israel cannot just allow this to happen on its own soil and not not somehow seek um, uh, uh, you could say vengeance or, or you could say redress. Yeah. That That is easy to understand, but, but the continuing support for the continuing killing of civilians, what, where does he derive that from? As, as someone without is, an investment it, in the it's area. It's all of the, the, the things he hear that okay. Hamas is hiding in hospitals, that yes. Hamas is hiding everywhere behind civilians, um, that these are kids of um, the Palestinian people. It, he finds it, he's in that... So he's ended up thinking phone, there's um, no... Su- another writer, you yes. used to have something of a one wonderful expression, I'm paraphrasing now, where he said that when you are a child, your feelings take precedence. By the time you grow, the damage has been done, meaning that okay. your feelings have already You've formed signed your up. opinions. You've signed yes. up, as it were. So that's, he's going by that. He thinks that it's justifiable. Yeah, fair enough. And he, and he thinks that I'm betraying the cause of Israel by feeling guilty and crying like the other lady. Just before wanting him, less or, death. Yes, for, for what's happening. And he thinks, no, because they're doing all of these protests in London. They're removing the photos of... Um, Israeli um, hostages, which uh, is a disgusting, hostages, yes. a disgusting which, thing to which, do. It, it was a disgusting thing, but not all of them are doing it. No, so of course there not. There is a medium here, and trying for him. My daughter understands it a bit more, but he is, I think, more because he has still this kind of the protection. And he's dug in now. Started in men, yes. Yes, he's dug in. So uh, he he would. It's difficult. He would argue that there are there is no such thing as an innocent Palestinian. No, he, he knows it, but he thinks that he's a bit Machiavellian now. I'm sorry, I'm okay. quoting only a writer. No, 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 there, enough. In, 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 he enough. thinks that the means justify... Um, yes, the end justifies the means. And, and the, the, the end, end goal. justifies the means, yes. Yeah, yes. I hear you. And, and I'd say again, it sounds to me like you're doing a very difficult job as well as anyone could in, 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 in the circumstances. Um, I, some might say I am as well, but that's, that's for you to judge. Thank you, El Rabi. Uh, this chat wouldn't. James O'Brien taking a call from a lady stating that there are, there are only 100 Christians left in Gaza and her source is Al Jazeera and he lets that fly unchallenged. This is what Jewish people are facing. I dare you to challenge that. I don't know what you mean. I'm really sorry. I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, she said a thousand, I think, not a hundred. And the reason why I asked her what her source for that was, was so that she would tell me, and then you could decide whether or not that was a source that you trusted. I don't know what you mean when you say, this is what Jewish people are facing. I dare you to challenge that. I, I, I mean, I did. I said, what's your source? That's how you challenge things. And then someone says what their source is. And you decide whether you accept that as a, as a trustworthy source or not. You know, do you accept the IDF's claim this morning that the release of the footage of the um, Palestinian men, including journalists, identified journalists who they described as all being suspect, Hamas suspects, that that footage has made its way into the public space somehow by accident, that it was never the intention of the people who took the footage for it to be seen in that? Do you, do you accept that? As a, I don't know, but I'll find out what the source is and then let you reach your own judgment. So when you say, I dare you to challenge that, I think you just sound a bit silly. With respect. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 
It's 10.49. Rishi Sunak is in front of the COVID inquiry. Um, I, 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 listen, I know what you think when I say that. Just It's too outrageous to be true. I sometimes turn out to have been very naive or, or, or trusting. But I, I, the WhatsApp stuff, it must be true, mustn't it? Unless it comes from a place of complete desperation. Uh, one of the first things he's been asked at the inquiry is what happened to his WhatsApp messages, to which he has responded by saying that he's not a prolific user of WhatsApp. He mainly uses it for communication with his private office. Um, And he says he doesn't have access to any of the messages sent during the pandemic as he's changed phones multiple times over the past few years. Well, I'm pretty sure I've changed phones multiple times over the past few years and that my WhatsApp messages move with me. Is 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 it not a cloudy thing where the... Also, if I log on to my... Laptop. If I log on to my WhatsApp account on my laptop, don't I find all the messages that I've currently got on my phone? Or not? I think I do. And that's what I mean. That it, 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 If it is as bonkers as it sounds at first glance, I don't think they would have tried it. But anyway, we'll be catching up with events there at some point today. 10.51 is the time. Back to the question of... Um, the continuing bombardment of Gaza and the vetoing of a ceasefire uh, call at the United Nations, a ceasefire that would also have called for the unconditional release of all hostages and uh, um, and an uptick, a massive upsurge in humanitarian access. It wouldn't have happened, I don't think, but everybody except the United States and the United Kingdom with a vote wanted it to. 10.51 is the time. Neil is in Stanmore. Neil, what would you like to say? Morning, James. Um, how many rockets have been fired into Israel from Gaza? I don't know. Okay, there's 11,500. How many civilians have died? Ah, they haven't died because over the last 16 years, uh, while Hamas have been firing rockets into Israel and carrying out suicide bombings and attacks on uh, civilians... Listen, it's a simple... I'm just looking for a number. They've they've developed... uh, I'm just looking uh, for the number now. Very few is the answer because they've developed Is it not none? No, there have been, of course, there have been injuries, of course, there have been deaths. With, by missile? I know there was a suicide yes. attack at a bus stop, but single figures? It probably is single figures. But and how many people have died in Gaza how, in the last how, two how, months? How many, how many no, bomb no, shelters listen, are Neil, no, 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 how many bomb shelters okay, are no, no, no. there? How many bomb shelters are there in Gaza? Mate, there aren't no, any houses. They've built thousands. There aren't any buildings. houses in there's Gaza. Hundreds, How can you have a bomb hundreds. shelter if you haven't got a house to put it under? Because they have, they have hundreds of miles of tunnels that what, have been what built is, by Hamas. What is the reason for your call? Because what mm-hmm. we've established so far is that there are between ten and 20,000 deaths on one side and single figures deaths on the other. So wh- where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? So where we you, go? I just, you rang Israel, me, remember? Is, yes, I did. Israel is... Well, firstly, they are trying to wipe out the tunnel networks that Hamas have built with the assistance of the United Nations, who've allowed them to divert funds and building materials. Okay, to build... Right, and your source for that? They are there. That's what the Israelis... Oh, your source, source for the allegation against the United Nations? No, everyone knows that there are... <laughs> oh, come on, mate. <laughs> your source for oh, the United Nations so, collusion in that? Uh, well, my, my opinion... No, your that, source. My source? Yes. I have to challenge you because the caller here said that, that if Al Jazeera is a source, I have to challenge people. So I can't accept Neil in Stanmore as a source on something, can I? OK, I have various websites, not websites, I have news information sites on. that are showing me that the entrances to tunnels... No, no, specifically um, the United Nations collusion. Where, where can I look for that? Where can you look for that? Um, ooh, that's going to be a bit difficult for me to... Well, then uh, don't say it on the radio, Neil, please. It's my opinion. No, you have to say it's your opinion. You stated it as a fact. It's your opinion based on absolutely no evidence whatsoever. Okay. All right. So well, let's look at the United Nations. Before we move on, can we just agree that you said that with no evidence or basis in truth for it at all? It is stuff that I've seen, but I can't necessarily provide the... uh... So there is evidence, but it goes to a different school? Yes. Okay, mate, you crack on. Um, Okay, so we have the United Nations who had this vote. Okay, so first of all, uh, we have a situation in Syria a couple of few years ago. No, uh, you're, you're doing it again. Had, Let's just focus uh, no, on... We're, we're, no, we're, I won't hang on, Neil, because we've already uh, established that you're a bad faith caller, so you're lucky that you're still on. Let's focus on exactly what happened on Friday. Let's not talk about what happened somewhere else several years ago. But it's relevant. No, it's you, not. You're, you're I want to know what happened on Friday. 
right? You said the Britain and sorry, Britain abstains and America vetoed. Mm-hmm. Russia vetoed in Syria, where there were hundreds of thousands. And, of and the international uproar was enormous. Mm, was it? Yes, it was. Sources: BBC, ITV, Sky, LBC. You crack on. Well, I think that's uh, limited. But the <laughs> the score is. Um, Gutierrez has only ever done this once. He he hasn't done it in any other conflict that's uh, taken place in trying to stop a war that's taking place. Because he's he's never felt that the need for a ceasefire was so obvious and acute. Sorry, 500,000 people in Syria wasn't... Yes, that, that, well, if, if we were to add up people being killed on both sides, like we did at the beginning of your call, the definition of war would apply because they were they killing they were killing each other on an enormous scale. So, so again, that doesn't work. Okay, here's a question: Why did Switzerland vote for a ceasefire? Did I? The most famously neutral country in history. I have no idea why they chose to vote. For why did Japan? Don't know. I'm not there. I'm not in those countries. Why did Ecuador? What they think? Ecuador because they are particularly uh, hold up with most of the uh, groups that uh, are very anti-Israel. Source. Uh, again, I would. Uh, okay, I have my reasons and beliefs. And what I've seen. Well, so, um, so, so, so. I mean, everyone does at Christmas. What, 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 <laughs> what are your sources? As I say, I have access to new sites that. Uh, no, no. The source for Ecuador being holed up with various groups. Not, not the source for the United Nations colluding with Hamas building tunnels in the Gaza Strip, because we've established you didn't have any. What's the source for the claim about Ecuador? Again, just what I've seen from United Nations voting uh, systems over... But you told me they've never had a vote like this before. You said that, they you said that 45 they, seconds they, ago. They've had, but they've, they've had... There, there, are, there are votes the whole time. So what was the uh, Ecuador vote Israel. that you, you're drawing on now? On, specifically on now? Yes. No, I'm just saying that in, in, in general... In the well, past, go on, well, give me one example vote, then. They voted against Israel. I can't give you... I can't pluck off the top of my head. Uh, well, then you can't say it out loud, can you? But, well, there are facts. You can look on the United Nations no, I'm website. I'm asking you to tell me the facts that you're referring to. Well, I'm, And how I'm is saying... calling for a ceasefire and an immediate return of all the Israeli hostages a vote against Israel? How is it a vote against Israel? Because it's not allowing them to finish what they need to do, which is to demolish the tunnels that exist and the infrastructure of Hamas who, for the last 16 years... Yeah, so we're, we're, we're back there. Israel. Do you want to speculate on why Switzerland voted for the ceasefire? Because you, you have enormous levels of certainty built on absolutely nothing, so it's a bit odd when you say you don't know something. Do your sources not have anything on this? The, the news sites that you can't remember, or the Ecuadorian precedents that have slipped your mind, do none of them have any insights into why the most famously neutral country on the planet would vote for a, for a humanitarian ceasefire? Nope. Nothing at all. No, I can look and, it up. And when you hang up in a minute, or when I bid you farewell because it's the news, the fact that every single thing you've said has absolutely fallen apart and crumbled won't have dented your certainty one iota, will it? Nope. About anything? Nope. And if I ask you how many people in Gaza have to die before it becomes too many, you will say... I don't know because it's... it's you do it's, know, Neil. You're, you're Mr. You're Mr. I know it all, man. You must know. Come on. <laughs> I don't want any death. Put a number all. on it. There isn't a... There How many isn't is a too many? I can put on it. There isn't a number I can put on it. Well, we can say that it's not there yet, can't we? Because is it too many already? Or Probably. should they carry on? The answer is they need to carry on. So it's and not my, too many my, yet. My, 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 so my it's home. not too many yet. When will it be too many? I don't know, but my hope you do is know. at some point... You do know. know. We both know, know what your answer to that question point. is. The only mystery is why you won't say women, it out loud. No, the women of... I hope, my hope is the women of Hamas, at some point, turn around and say, we've had enough. Right, we've had 17 years... But you're, you, 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 you're not in control of that. You're in control of your I'm opinions, not, Neil. You've just spent 10 minutes telling us all about your opinions and pretending that they were facts and evidence-based and knowledge-based. So you're allowed an opinion. In your opinion... 
We know that whatever the death toll is now is still too low for it to be too much. When does it become too high, in your opinion? I have no idea when that, what that number is. You have no idea of your own opinion? I have no idea of when enough, of how many deaths there will be. I don't know that. You don't know that. Nobody knows I, that. I can say there's been too many already. You can't. When will you? I did say there's been too many already. No, you didn't. You said they had to carry I on. I, no, I said... That no, you said everyone heard you. You said they had to carry on. I so how many is too enough. many? I've said there's already been enough. Right, but I can't so you are in favour of a ceasefire then? I'm not in favour of a ceasefire. So there no, hasn't been enough. When no, will there be enough? We need, we need to stop the fighting the, oh, sorry we need to stop the that's a ceasefire stopping the fighting the is a ceasefire no, we need Neil. to stop the terrorist atrocities that have been happening for the seven, last 17 years yes so how many deaths is too many in Gaza there isn't a number well everyone knows that there is and you're just not prepared to say it out loud Neil 40 million alright it doesn't mean anything no right? but if everybody there died would that be too many? That's, that, no, that is, not, that, well, that is not my belief of what is going to be happening. So that and means that somewhere happy. between think, now, yeah, Israel, somewhere Israel between is now, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm ask this question, somewhere between now and everybody dead, there would be a line for you that should not be crossed. Why is it so hard for you to tell us where that line is? Because they need to do what they need to do in terms of destroying Hamas. And so Hamas there is no line then? No. So everyone... No, nope, it won't be everyone, but... Well, fingers crossed, eh, Neil? Yep, very much so. It's 11.01. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Five minutes after 11 is the time. Um, something a little bit strange happened this morning when I opened up the newspapers. Uh, I, uh, or even when I saw some of the front pages, I uh, was pretty clear over the course of the weekend that absolutely everybody, except people pretty much on the payroll, were critical of Rishi Sunak's so-called Rwanda scheme. I want to do a phone-in on why the... <sighs> do you know what I really want to do a phone-in on? But I can't do phone-ins on stuff like this because it never works. I want to do a phone-in on whether or not anybody outside this little bubble is actually talking about it. Um, not to give away any trade secrets, but you can see on our switchboard how many calls are coming into the station for topics, even if you're not currently on air, even if you're not presenting. And if the editorial lines of the Daily Mail and the Telegraph were right, then you would expect phone-ins about Rwanda to be absolutely exploding. They really are not. It is, you know, elements of the conversation might kick off, but they're more likely to be... Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, how has, how has Rishi Sunak managed to get himself into such a mess, which is a discussion of the politics rather than the policy. But everywhere you look, the policy is coming in for a right old kicking. Rishi Sunak finds himself in the extraordinary position of being attacked from what is somewhat laughably called the left of his own party. That would be sort of one nation Tories who are keen that the United Kingdom doesn't follow Russia and Belarus down a sort of um, road of resistance to international law. One nation Tories would include people like Tom Tugendhat and Caroline Noakes. Um, the legislation must stick to domestic and international human rights com commitments. So it is now controversial in the context of Rishi Sunak's Conservative Party for Conservative MPs to say, I don't think we should break the law or rewrite it to pretend that we're not breaking the one that went before. That's extraordinary, right? So, But they're in his own party, so they're criticising the legislation. Then you've got no fewer than three gangs of headbangers. Um, the ERG, they're still around, would you believe? Something called the New Conservatives, not to be confused with the New New Conservatives, who came after the New Conservatives to replace the Old Conservatives. They uh, include people called Danny Kruger and Mir Miriam Cates. And then you've got the... Common Sense Group, which contains, um, well, animated pork products, actually, of which someone has stuck two ears on a piece of gammon because you've got Brendan Clark Smith, Lee Anderson and Jonathan Gullis, who, I, I mean, are kind of interchangeable. I wonder how many people, if all three of them walked into a room at any one time, would be able to distinguish one from the other. They just sort of sit on the back benches grunting really, and then uh, I, I, I sort of claim they speak for silent majorities. There are 30 people in their group, and they're criticising the Rwanda scheme as well. So you've got 40 
members of parliament criticising the Rwanda scheme in the European Research Group because it doesn't go far enough. You've got 35 in the so-called new conservatives who are, are calling for manifesto pledges to cut legal migration, which, of course, is two or three times what it was before the Brexit that they told you to vote for in order to cut legal migration. You've got 30-odd members in 30p Lenox gang um, who I think, and I haven't actually clarified this or checked the science, but I think they all share one brain cell in the same way that the witches in Macbeth shared the, the, the thing that allowed them to speak. And then you've got 110 members from the one nation group who hold the outrageous position of thinking that a British government shouldn't break British law or international law. So they're all criticising the Rwanda scheme, Rishi Sunak's Rwanda scheme, all of them. 40 plus 35 is 75 plus another 30 is 105. So that's about 245 identified and counted Conservative members of Parliament who are critical for various reasons and to varying degrees of Rishi Sunak's Rwanda policy. Everyone is critical of Rishi Sunak's Rwanda policy. People who are racist think that it doesn't go far enough and that we should just be deporting people willy-nilly as soon as we've decided whether or not we like the look of them. And then there are people who think that human rights are quite important if you're a human. And therefore, even though sometimes it involves decisions and uh, practices that are suboptimal or less than perfect, you mustn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And if you are a human, human rights are a good idea. I fully accept if you're listening to this and you're not a human, then you are perfectly entitled to think that human rights are, are somehow bad and to be resisted and terrible. And of course, of course, in order to be worth anything at all, a human right has to appeal to and apply to every human can't just apply to humans who were born here or humans who are Capricorn or humans who, uh, I, I, I don't know, wear boxer shorts instead of briefs. It can't just apply. Human rights have to apply to every human, even, even humans who came here on dinghies or who fell out of the sky on Christmas Eve. Whatever human it may be, for a human right to be worth the paper that it's printed on, it has to apply to every human. But I fully accept that if you're not a human, then that may not be something that's easy to understand. So with the government's Rwanda policy coming under attack from uh, every single wing of the government's party, the Conservative Party, um, who do you think the Daily Mail has attacked today for criticising the government's Rwanda scheme. And you know I've written a book called How They Broke Britain, and you know that it details the absolute insanity into which we have been led by people like Paul Dacre, the editor-in-chief of the Daily Mail, Rupert Murdoch, um, uh, the, the, the owner of The Sun, various uh, dodgy uh, dealers calling themselves experts or think tanks or whatever it may be without telling us who pays their wages and profoundly awful people like Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage and David Cameron and, and, and the rest of them. But, you know, you, you sometimes, even as the author of a book that details that decline, that self-inflicted and utterly unnecessary diminishment of our international status and our national standing, our national health, not just the National Health Service, but our actual health as a nation, our mental health, our physical health. As a and even as someone who's written that book, there are days when I look at this paper in particular, which remains by far the most popular in the country. Trust me, I'd much rather never think about it again. But it sets the tone for government policy, not just your Uncle Keith's Facebook page. It sets the tone for government policy. Has done since the referendum was called, really, in 2015, arguably since before that even, overtaking Rupert Murdoch's son as the newspaper that prime ministers and cabinet members turn to first in the morning to find out what to think about something. The Daily Mail, in a country where the party of government is beset from within with widespread and violent criticism of its own Rwanda, so-called Rwanda policy, the Daily Mail has dedicated its entire front page to attacking Gary Lineker for signing a letter criticising the government's Rwanda policy. So, hands up if you haven't criticised the government's Rwanda policy. 
well, this is awkward. There must be someone who hasn't criticised the government's Rwanda policy, not currently in the cabinet. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? OK, so pretty much everyone who's expressed an opinion of the government's so-called Rwanda policy has been critical of it. But when Gary Lineker signs an open letter simply calling for the policy to be scrapped because it has essentially failed on both fronts, it's the biggest story in the biggest selling newspaper of the country. And all of the... I don't know how to describe them. I, I don't want to sound unkind. But all of the people who turn to the Daily Mail every morning to find out what to think about things will now join in. So social media will be full of people. Nick had a caller claiming that she doesn't want to pay for Gary Lineker's platform from which he espouses these opinions, these compassionate, sincere and thoughtful opinions. And you think, well, where do you think he does it from? Do you think he does a 10-minute monologue? at the top of match of the day to talk about everything from homelessness to the Rwandan policy? Do you think he turns to Alan Shearer and Ian Wright and says, I'll be with you in a minute, lads. I'm just going to give them 10 minutes on refugees. What is this platform you pay for from which Gary Lineker shares his compassionate opinions? It's actually hilarious the way the man gets talked about and written about. Tory MPs enraged as BBC star signs Lovey's letter attacking Rwanda policy. Tory MPs enraged because man signs letter. These, will, these are the same MPs who this time tomorrow will be telling you how important it is that we have free speech and also that if universities don't sing the national anthem at graduation ceremonies, they should be shut down immediately. I mean, the, 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 this is what I mean about the book. That I've done a pretty good job in How They Broke Britain of describing the absolute madness which has engulfed us as a nation. And I've done a pretty good job of describing its roots, explaining how it happened, where it comes from, some of it deliberate, some of it accidental, all of it bonkers. But but there are moments in writing it and in reading it where you step back from the page a bit and you just go, but this is, this is insane. This is insane. He's, he's one of the most successful footballers the country has ever produced. And he's got very widespread opinions on difficult subjects that he shares on social media for which he is not paid and in open letters also signed by people like um, Juliet Stevenson, Brian Cox and, uh, and David Morrissey, actors. Just 30 public figures signed a letter which criticises the government's Rwandan policy. We've got 200-odd Conservative MPs currently criticising the Rwandan policy. But when Gary Lineker criticises the Rwandan policy, Tory MPs who have also criticised the Rwandan policy are enraged, so enraged, where then the Daily Mail ring up and say, can we quote you as being enraged in tomorrow's paper? Jonathan Gullis says, and, and that's what, what's happened to us as a country now, because the Daily Mail is important. I wish it wasn't. You can tell me that it isn't important to you, but it is. The best-selling newspaper in the country is now having an absolute fit because a, f a, a TV presenter and former footballer has criticised the Rwandan policy that they criticise every day. Oh, riddle me that. Make sense of that to me. And then you hear people, presumably vaguely sensible people, claiming that they pay for Gary Lineker. They pay for his platform. Hey, do you know that Jeremy Clarkson was on the BBC payroll when he called Gordon Brown a one-eyed Scottish idiot? Yeah. Now, that's odd, isn't it? Because I can't remember any Tory MPs queuing up to complain about a BBC presenter calling an elected prime minister, or actually an unelected prime minister, a one-eyed Scottish idiot. But when, when a BBC presenter chooses to write, and I think Jeremy Clarkson said that on the BBC, actually. I, it may have been on Australian television. Or I've just got a feeling in my head it happened on the one show. for some, No, it must have been on Australian television. But he was on the BBC payroll when he said it. Gary Lineker says, this, this uh, Rwandan policy that all the Tories are criticising, it's not very good, is it? So I've got a question for you. I've got an answer you won't be amazed to hear. And I have written about it at length in the new book. Well, not at that much length. There's one other person on this list. Two people with considerable popularity and sizable public platforms who are not paid for their opinions. There are two people in the country currently 
who the Daily Mail and the, and the Gaminati cannot abide because they share their opinions. It's not Nagger who got a kicking all weekend for having the audacity to present Have I Got News For You and do jokes. Actually, it's a very popular and successful brown woman on the television that people have a problem with, but of course they won't say that bit out loud, just like our caller earlier wouldn't say the number out loud of, of how many deaths he's prepared to support or endorse or sit with in, in, in Gaza. A lot of people who claim that freedom of speech is really important trying to shut other people down while being too frightened to say what they think out loud because they're so ashamed of what it is. So it's not Naga. Can you think who it is? Who's the only other? And remember, neither of them get paid for their opinion. So the question I've got for you, and I'd like you to ring in and answer it now without any more input from me, is why does... Gary Lineker wind this lot up so much. What is it about Gary Lineker that winds this lot up so much? Why does Paul Dacre go to bed every night with a little wax effigy of Gary Lineker, one of the most successful strikers in the history of English football and, and a hugely successful entrepreneur? What is it? I mean, he's, he's a working class lad from Leicester. He's the son of a market trader. He's a model of aspiration and success. He's a, a walking poster boy for social mobility. He's, he's invited refugees into his own home, so you can't even accuse him of being hypocritical or virtue signalling. Why does Paul Dacre go to bed every night with a wax effigy of Gary Lineker to stick pins into? What is it about Gary Lineker that winds these people up so much? And if these people means you, you know, come one, come all, what is it about Gary Lineker that winds you up so much? Especially as someone who really believes in free speech, freedom of expression. What, what is it about this man at this time in British political history that boils so much gammony urine? James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.23 and um, I, listen, I can't promise that, 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 that I'll go easy on you, but if, if he does boil your proverbial P, then what is it about Gary Lineker that, that you find so upsetting? Because it's not as if there are many people in the public space who have uh, a, a, a platform, and in this case a self-built platform. It's usually his Twitter account. On this occasion, it's an open letter. They have a platform, an unpaid platform, from which to share compassionate and sincere opinions. Now, they might be compassionate and sincere opinions that you don't agree with. They, you might not even agree with the description of the opinions as compassionate and sincere, but you're a free speech supporter, so you fully respect my right to describe them as compassionate and sincere. And bearing in mind that you were probably silent when Jeremy Clarkson called the actual Prime Minister a one-eyed Scottish idiot, you don't really believe in your heart of hearts that people presenting non-political programs on the BBC should be banned from having any political opinions whatsoever. Of course you don't. But So what is it about him that upsets you so much? And I really mean that. Have a think about it, because I, I don't want to be rude, but I've got a feeling you may never actually have thought about it before. So the Daily Mail front page to say says, put a sock in it, Lineker and then dedicate several pages to all the Conservative MPs who are currently criticising the Rwanda policy that Gary Lineker is criticising. So what is it about him in particular? And only one correct answer so far. No, there's actually quite a few correct answers. You're quite right. The other one is Carol Vorderman. So there are two people in, in public life in the United Kingdom who have used success built up over years in various forms and formats to offer up narratives and opinions that are critical of governments supported to the hilt by right-wing newspapers owned by billionaires. So who do you think is more influential? Carol Vorderman and Gary Lineker, or the Daily Mail, the Mail on Sunday, the Times, the Sunday Times, the Sun, the Sun on Sunday, the Express, the Daily Express, the Daily Telegraph and the Sunday Telegraph. In one corner, all 10 of those papers. That corner over there, Gary Lineker and Carol Vorderman. In the case of Lineker, why does it hack them off so much? So I'm not entirely sure. Unless they're simply terrified of disagreement and they're so completely in control of public discourse that they, have, that they lose their heads when someone is able to break out of line. 
Brian's in Rickmansworth. Brian, what would you like to say? Oh, good morning. Thank Hello. you for keeping me sane. Well, yeah, I'm afraid I can't take self-diagnosis on questions of sanity, Brian. You're going to have to provide a doctor's letter to confirm that you are actually still sane. I think I am. The reason why they're after him is because of his 8 million following, and it's probably the same for Carol Vorderman. They can't corrupt his message. Um, it gets out completely uncensored to people that they don't want it to get out to. I mean, it's bothering his vastly probably football fans, ordinary working class people that have then be given information and a different view to the one they're giving them every morning with their breakfast. We've got the same thing going on in America. The Republicans are after Taylor Swift because she's got this huge following. And when she puts something out, her fans respond. Well, she when hardly she ever puts... I mean, here's a sentence I never thought I'd have to say on live radio. I'm not sure you can compare Gary Lineker to Taylor Swift, Brian. One is very free with his opinions and one is not. When Taylor Swift endorsed someone because she's worried about the other person, loads of young people registered to vote. That's very they true. So they're, they're scared of these people because these ordinary people with a vast following of ordinary, decent human beings can start to get information unfiltered from But does people. that mean, Brian, that, that somewhere, and they probably wouldn't be able to admit this to themselves, but somewhere deep inside, they must be conscious of how easily dismantled their own position is because yep. if, if Lineker was dancing around the place offering up opinions that that were easily dismissed or easily exploded then they wouldn't get their knickers in such an almighty yeah. twist would they no, because they know how easy it is to twist people, because they've been doing it for years. They've got this system running. They put it in the newspapers in the morning, whatever it is they want to spin this day, and then the BBC in their discussion programmes pick up the front pages. Yeah, that's very they unfortunate. They never go and look for anything else. They just repeat and repeat. Now, the American Republican Party used the repeat-repeat method really successfully a few, a few years ago. They're doing it again. It looks like it's just... I know, and, 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 no, it does. So, I mean, here's the mad bit of today's example. You've got... Do you think anyone at the Mail, when they're putting this together, they're putting the page together, they've literally written on page six, right? Yep. Tory centrists and right-wingers criticise Rwanda bill as PM prepares for crunch vote tomorrow. So they're essentially describing the Conservative Party as turning its, tearing itself to pieces over a Rwanda bill that they are all criticising. And in the same breath, on page seven, on the next page, there's a big picture of Gary Lineker again, because he is also criticising the Rwanda bill. So they're attacking him for doing what the Tories are doing, but he's doing it in the wrong way. Do you think anybody there realises how ridiculous that looks? No, no, and they don't care because the people won't pick it up, the people that read particular stories. I mean, I'm quite guilty. When I used We're to all guilty. Into Brian. London, yes. I used to read the Daily Mail to get angry on the way to work because yes. I performed much better when I was working when I was sort of angry. Got, you got a, bit of, got a bit of fire in your belly. Yeah. When I was lackadaisical, I didn't really work as well. But if I got in a bit steaming, I was on fire before I sat down. I've gone and the I other way. Re- I've gone the other way. I used to be angry all the time. Now I'm Mr. Chill and the, and the audience no, has gone through the roof. Now, I've been retired for a long time and I've wandered around Rickmansworth, around the Aquadrome, listening to you. Oh, and lovely. it's kept me good for years since... Well, well thank you. I'm glad, and I bet you're happier for it, aren't you? But I take your point about that uh, sort of... Uh, I mean, it's a two-minute hate, isn't it? It's all over Orwell. It's all over 1984. But what is it about... I mean, what? I mean, I'm, I listen, because you're not going to like that analysis if you're an anti linekerite The reason why you hate him so much is because you realise how ugly your opinions look when he holds up a mirror to them. And if, if his opinions are so ridiculous and he should stick to football, uh, why? Surely, surely, if his opinions are wrong and ridiculous, you can just point and laugh at them. You could say something like, well, why don't you let a refugee live in your house then? Admittedly, he'd, he'd respond to that by saying, I, I, I do. But you definitely don't look silly. Thomas Watts is here with your headline. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.34 is the time. It's an interesting question, isn't it? The uh, uh, absolute rage that Gary Lineker provokes every time he gets out of bed in the morning. And the way that he, he handles it, I wonder whether you need to have played football at the very highest level or you need to have done something where the emotions, you, you, you know, you can't let your emotions control you. You have to be cool-headed. That, 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 that sort of training almost for, for this 
level of attention. He's had it since he was a kid, this level of attention. He's had people shouting all sorts of ab- uh, abuse at him every Saturday for, for most of his adult life. I wonder whether that helps you grow a different sort of skin from the one that the rest of us had. Because, look, I, I, I mean, I get a tiny, tiny fraction of the sort of abuse that Gary Lineker gets. And it, even I sometimes think, oh, I wonder if I should wind my neck in a bit, or I wonder if I should... I may even subconsciously do so. But I do it every day for three hours, so it's, it's going to be subconscious. He knows what's going to happen when he makes a point that he thinks is important, when he signs an open letter, when he criticises a government policy. He knows what the reaction is going to be. He knows that Jonathan Gullis is going to give an interview to the Daily Mail saying, uh, uh, uh. he knows that's what's going to happen. And, and yet he cracks on. And I happen to know on a personal level that he does it because he thinks it matters. He thinks it's important. And I wonder whether the reaction makes it even more important. But why does it boil them so much? Why does it enrage them so much? Gary Lineker hacks them off, says Alan, who's in Dover, because he's from a working class background, hugely successful, and refuses to know his place and stay in his box. He never got out of the box in his playing days. According to their skewed view of the world, it's our old friend class again, says Alan, sadly. And the same is true for Carol Vorderman. I wonder if that's what it is. I wonder if there is a class element to it. That's why they let Clarkson... Well, no, because Clarkson's opinions they, they like and they share. I'd speculate that part of the reason the mail attacks Lineker, says Jan in Hampshire, is that he's a proxy for the BBC. In the minds of the male readership, Lineker represents the BBC, therefore it reinforces the male's propaganda line that the BBC is a hotbed of lefty, woke, middle-class elites and, by extension, therefore deserves to be defunded. And, of course, they can't prove that ludicrous thesis using anybody in the business of reporting the news or covering politics, so they have to focus on the match of the day presenter instead. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The editorial, senior editorial staff at the Daily Mail. I, you think you've got a low opinion of Daily Mail readers. You should meet the bosses at the Daily Mail. They must think their readers are as thick as mints. Thicker. Thicker than mints. Otherwise, there's no other way of understanding the uh, approach that they take, particularly on an issue like this, lad, like Gary Lineker. Ronnie's in Leicester, hometown. What would you like to say, Ronnie? Um... James, I just think Erinica is just absolutely amazing. Um, I think he's one of those guys that the last three, four generations have either been cheering for him to score a goal for England in a World Cup or cheering for him for, for what he actually stands up and believes in. I think he's probably the only person right now that actually talks to the lads from Eton yeah. and the lads from a council estate. And that, and that means that what he says is actually quite important, well, very important. And the people who are in the actual business of trying to influence public opinion, he becomes like kryptonite to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. So really what they're terrified of is his opinions. His opinions. Reaching people. Yeah, reaching people. He reaches everybody. It doesn't matter whether or not you're born three and a lot or whether you're three (laughs) and a down. (laughs) He, he, He supports everybody. Really say, well, well, rather, he he has access to everybody because there's plenty of people he doesn't support, and, and he's pretty clear about who would be on that list. So, I, I mean, I, I mean, some of it might be commercial. They might just have realised that when they have a swing at Gary Lineker, they sell a few more papers than they do on days when they don't. But but the the, the sheer scale of the abuse that he gets from the most senior media outlets, the most popular media outlets in the country can we explain all of that under your analysis they are so terrified of him pointing out that some of the language used by conservative politicians about refugees is reminiscent of 30s germany something endorsed by holocaust survivors one of whom actually asked suella braverman to moderate her language and suella braverman told her to ch- chuff off so is it yeah. can we the whole level of abuse can be justified simply by his relatively widespread and and inoffensive opinions Absolutely, yeah. and may I give my opinion why? You may. He speaks to the terrorists, as in the you're terraces. playing football. So, yeah, 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 sorry. I thought so, you said the terrorists so, then. I thought, bloody <laughs> hell, he's in enough trouble as it is, it, Ronnie. It, it, that's right. I'm sorry, I do apologise. That's all right. Yeah, if, if, for example, he can speak to the, to, to the right of yeah. football, and he can speak to the left of football, and he can speak to the centre, which I know football is not everything or the be all to anybody oh, else. It is for a lot but, of people. But a lot of people it is. A lot of people it's their life. And he's 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 reaching them through socials, he's reaching them through through football.
football. He's also reaching them through, through media. Because there's a lot of people from estates where I was born that wouldn't even turn on LBC or wouldn't even listen sure. to the news or listen to anything like this. So this is a way that he's able to tap in to those minds that don't have nothing to do with politics but actually hear it. And actually say, hey, uh, and, he's got a point. And, and there's only him, really, uh, uh, with, with yeah. Carol Vorderman playing the role of Robin to his Batman, if you like. But, I mean, that, they're so terrified of genuine dissent or disagreement or anybody shining a light upon the toxicity of what they punt every day that the size of the platform is important. But it is, it is so illustrative of how cowardly and, 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 and querulous and, and pathetic they are that they've got a country in which there is only really one or two people with a big platform who speak out against... And remember, these are the people that brought you Brexit, they brought you Boris Johnson, they brought you Liz Truss, they brought you Rishi Sunak. These are the people that brought you all the things that have broken Britain, and yet they remain absolutely terrified of anyone standing up, pointing at them and saying, yeah, you, you, you're, not that, you're not very nice, are you? And these policies are yours, they're not very good. Thank you, Ronnie. Rob's in New Cross. Rob, what would you like to say? Happy Monday. Thank you. Is it? Is that a thing? I'm not sure that's a thing. Well, it's a band uh, in the singular. But anyway, what made you pick up the phone today, Rob? The Alan was right. He stole my thunder a bit. Oh. Um, it is. Yes, it's definitely true. Dacre regards Lineker as some sort of class traitor. Yeah. And was setting it as an example. And of course, Carl Carl Vorderman as well. They're both from the same story, and they're both white, which makes a difference, I think, because if it was Ian Wright was saying these things, yeah. you wouldn't get him attacked in the same way. Be a different sort it, of attack. It, it, there'd, be, there'd be, there'd be an, an element, that sometimes it's a, that you get the impression they're suggesting that people of colour are ungrateful when they criticise the UK too, government. That too, but it's, he's not making the same appeal to the same audience. No. With Lineker breaks that barrier, and in some ways, he's like a sort of Uncle Tom today, if he, if he river turned things upside down. You mean in a class sense? Yeah. In that he should have helped pull up the drawbridge. He should be yeah. sort of take, yeah. doing what Paul Dacre does and living off crumbs from Viscount Rothermere's table and being jolly grateful for it, thank you very much. Standard class mobility story is, yeah, council estate to Tory donor. And then I can, you can use me as proof that we don't have inequality in this country because anybody could end up as rich as me, and I prove that by the fact that I've ended up very rich. It's yeah. absolute nonsense. You are exceptions that prove rules. You, you are not, and prove in the traditional sense. You're not proving anything in, in well, the normal sense. I just, I, listen, I know him, and I really like him, obviously, and we share the same oh, opinions. We share, no, Gary Lineker, you prove. Oh, and, 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 and we share similar opinions on, on many subjects. But even I, and I do this for a living, and I chronicle this madness every day, the sheer scale of the opprobrium, and I had to Google that earlier to make sure I was spelling it correctly, the sheer scale of the opprobrium he attracts is absolutely remarkable, isn't it? Because he's, he's, he's dangerous. Because he represents somebody that the red wall, if you want to put it that way can aspire to and to, he can show that you don't have to and that's why they're desperate the to believe yeah of, the, of successful equals reactionary international modern forward-looking honest yeah. open compassionate Humane, de i mean the class the, the, the class condescension attached to the whole red wall phenomenon is it's all you're absolutely right they they, they look at someone like jonathan gullis or 30p lenock and claim that they're representative of working class communities, whereas, in fact, the, 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 the Vordermans and the Linekers of this world who have come from those streets and climbed to the highest pinnacles in our country, that you're right, I think, that they do. I mean, there is... So the, it's not just the opinions, it's the backstory, the personality, the character, the history. But I, I, I'd say it again, I, even I, as a, as a tireless chronicler of these madnesses, even I, on a day like today, the front page of the Daily Mail, there's a picture of Farage as well, who is the kind of person that the D Daily Mail think or want you to think understands what it's like to be working class. The, the, the Dulwich College educated um, collaborator with Alex Jones, the, the man who thinks that the Sandy Hook massacres were, were a hoax, the man who's talked a lot, of course, about how much power the Jewish lobby has in, in America, the man who continues to fluff for Donald Trump despite the the fact that Donald Trump has been shown to be 
the most egregious of liars. That That's OK. The Daily Mail's comfortable with him claiming to represent working class values in this country, but not someone actually, the, the, the son of a Leicester market trader who thinks that talking about refugees as if they're subhuman is reminiscent of 1930s Germany and that the current Rwanda plan is an almighty mess. And they agree with him that the current Rwanda plan is an almighty mess, but they just don't think that his definition of mess and his reasons for describing it as a mess, or his right even to describe it as a mess, is uh, is something that their readers are going to wear. It's 11.45. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12 minutes to 12. I, I think uh, I think Grant Shapps is quite an interesting character in The National Decline. I, I, I can't actually, I may need to check with someone who's read it more recently than I have. I can't remember whether I go in on him in the book because I, 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 I had to leave some people in the sidelines and, and, and some people who I describe as symptoms of the national malaise rather than the cause. But Shapps' career is fascinating, isn't it? Because he came to prominence, or rather he made his fortune, such as it is, from selling get-rich-quick schemes on the internet under a false name. I remember sitting here in front of this microphone, probably 13, just, just sort of 11 or 12 years ago. I think Cameron had made him party chairman or something like that. And I remember thinking, this isn't, this isn't normal. And this was long before the referendum was promised or, 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 or called or won by the... Um, the the side peddling nonsenses and untruths and of course lots and lots of racism all that lovely racism that got them over the line I remember thinking this can't be right you know I, for me growing up the Tory party was um, well it was it was the party of Ted Heath well not really I'm not that old it was the party of Margaret Thatcher and John Major but it was also the party of Douglas Hurd and Michael Heseltine Geoffrey Howe and Nigel Lawson I thought you can't have a man chairing the Conservative Party who made his money selling get-rich-quick schemes on the internet under a false name. And then he denied that he was still selling get-rich-quick schemes on the internet under a false name while being in Parliament. And someone found a picture of him selling get-rich-quick schemes on the internet under a false name while he was a member of Parliament. So he had to deny that as well. I remember thinking that there was a sort of disingenuous, a slimy dishonesty about Grant Shapps that would not be tolerated by the modern Tory party. I remember thinking that. And then I think he was involved in a group where bullying was so rife that uh, that um, a, a lad, a poor lad, ended up taking his own life. I, don't, don't, I forget what they were called. The the the. Oh, but I think I think Shaps was. Well, he would have been, wouldn't he, as chairman of the party, though, because they were a campaign group. But it was just so much ugliness around him. But basically, that slimy dishonesty. I thought, and I know you're thinking I'm very naive. But I did. I honestly don't think there would have been a place for that. I think Cameron was so lazy and arrogant and complacent. Someone said to him, "Oh yes, he's a bit of a slimy. He's a bit of a slime ball, Dave. But uh, but he really gets the bums on seats." And Cameron would have thought, "Oh, fair enough. Yeah, you crack on then, um, Michael Grant. Sorry, Sebastian. Whatever your name is, it's so hard to keep up, isn't it?" And and uh, the, the slimy dishonesty of Grant Shapps. It not only sounds like a, a Lorca play, but it also I think probably does signal a more significant breach with the past than we've realized. So who would you rather trust? Who would you whose opinion would you rather hear? Who do you think has more integrity on their CV? A man who came to fame or a man who made his fortune selling get rich quick schemes on the internet using a variety of false names and uh it has been alleged I think and never disproved a variety of false names and faked testimonials the uh he stood down as party chairman after re revelations that he knew about the bullying allegations against an aide so i didn't imagine that he was forced to quit as a minister after the father of a 21 year old claimed that his son would still be alive if grant shapps had behaved responsibly when made aware of the behavior of one of its senior organizers so it's worse than slimy dishonesty Grant Shapps, a really significant milestone on the road to national decline and, and, and deep, widespread Tory corruption. And now he's, now he's Home Secre uh, Foreign Secretary. That's incredible, right? So who, 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 who do you think has got more right to your ear? Who do you think has more intake? A bloke who resigned 
after revelations that he knew about bullying allegations that led a 21-year-old man... Defence Secretary, is he now? Defence Secretary. Who's got more integrity? The bloke selling get-rich-quick schemes on the internet under a variety of false names and then lying about it? Of course, Cameron is the Foreign Secretary, the bloke that made him party chairman. Who's got more integrity? Well, anyway, what do you think about Gary Lineker offering up opinions on a policy that pretty much everybody in the Tory party is condemning? I honestly think it'd be much better if he stuck to commenting on football. Says Grant Shapps, Michael Green, Sebastian Fox, Corrine Stockworth. He's used a whole variety of names in business, and yet he thinks he's got the right to tell Gary Lineker what he can and can't say on Twitter or in a letter. Listen to it again. I honestly think it'd be much better if he stuck to commenting on football. Secretary of State for Defence, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Green. Stroke, Sebastian Fox, stroke, Grant Shapp, stroke, Corinne Stockwell. Taking the moral high ground against Gary Lineker, who, to the best of my knowledge, has never made a penny deploying false names on the internet. Ben's in Hale Zone. Ben, why do they hate him so much? Not Grant Shapps, that's easy. Gary Lineker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think um, the one of your previous callers got halfway there, I think, with saying, you know, it's a de facto attack on or a proxy attack, rather, on, on the BBC. It, it personalises the BBC, which the mail and they can pay well, why, How come Vorderman gets so much, then? Because she's not really BBC. I know she had well, a show on BBC Wales until quite recently, but she's not seen as a... She, you know, she's a Channel 4 superstar, wasn't she, back in the day? So, uh, so, so my theory on this, mm. and it ties in with Lineker, is what we've got now is a Labour Party that is electable, sensible and dealing in tangible reality. Therefore, the mail, the right-wing press, are really now struggling to lay any fingers on the Labour leadership team or the Labour Party. 13 front pages on a completely legal and innocuous curry in County Durham, for example. That was their last go at it, wasn't it? Mm. Right? So they need a new target, which they can then tie and, try and tie into the Labour Party. Now, you know, look... 98% of the things I, I agree with Gary Lineker on, but I don't think he's particularly great on politics. I, I think it's a bit hurt uh, Tories. It's all a bit basic. It's a bit rudimentary. Um, well, and I, I, think, think, I think you do him a disservice, actually, but that's not the conversation we're having today. But, well, no, but, but I, I, I think it is because he hasn't got to deal in tangible change. So he deals in utopia because, he, just like you or me, he expresses an opinion. He hasn't got to say, well, actually, do you know what? We've got to make one of two bad choices because mm. those are the only options open. But they, it means the Tories can say, this guy isn't grounded in reality. This is what a Labour country looks like. It means and the Tories that use false names. Uh <laughs> Can, yeah, can, can accuse him of not being grounded in reality. I mean, you're right. I'm just marvelling at the madness of it all. Oh, yeah, but there's no point in moaning about the rules of the game. This and the is scale why, of it. Why... The scale of it. Can you can you genuinely get your head around that? Because I do this for a living and I struggle. Um, yeah, I can. The it, sheer it, scale. Front it. pages. Front pages of the Daily Mail. Because he's written in a letter, we need a new system that reflects the will of the British people who have opened their homes, donated and volunteered in their local communities. Uh, uh, that's a part of the population that includes him. That's why I'm backing this new campaign, because fair really can begin here. So I take your point about being a bit platitude, and although he has opened his home to refugees and he has donated and volunteered in his local community so so how can that boil so much gammon and urine because they've got to try and create some division somehow this is why the polls are looking very promising for labor because actually there's not a lot to be angry about with the people opposing the Tories because of where the Tories so and the let's right have get taken. angry with Gary Lineker because I can only deal in anger. Without anger, we've got... So, uh, I can't really get angry with Keir Starmer because, well, to the annoyance of many Labour supporters, he's not doing any of the things that I could encourage my readers to get angry about, you know? <clears throat> so, well, so Ben says they'll go for Lineker instead. That's a sort of proxy Labour figure. But I still find the sheer scale of it almost incomprehensible. Ian's in Shipley. Ian, what would you like to say? Uh, good morning, James. Good Hello. to talk to you again. And, and by the way, just 
keep your neck firmly out. That's what we uh, look <laughs> forward to most days. So please, <laughs> thank you. Keep I'll do my best. It in any time soon. Yeah, Gary Lineker. It, it's his platform, isn't it? It's massive um, on Twitter. But it's all his, his though. It's, I mean, it's it's, it's his. It it's not anybody yeah. else's. It's not been gifted to him by no. a billionaire. It's not. I mean, you know, Elon Musk's doing his best to undermine the effectiveness of having a big platform on Twitter if you hold essentially yeah. compassionate and liberal views. But it's not. I mean, it. it but you might. That doesn't make you wrong. It's still enormous. Enormous, isn't it? It's enormous, and that's what they're scared of because, um, like I say, it goes far and wide as this platform. And um, he is an England legend. He is one of England's all time best goal scorers. He was loved by the nation um, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and he, he, he is a nice guy. Why don't um, they just ignore him? Because I mean, you know, he's got eight, he's got nine million followers on Twitter. Most of them are going to be fo- footy people. They're not, you know. Why don't they just ignore him? He signs a letter. They'd have ignored it if his if his name wasn't on it. With the greatest of respect to Brian Cox, yeah. Juliet Stevenson, and David Morrissey, um, yeah. there's no way. And leaders of several faith groups. They leave that until paragraph five. Leaders mm. of several faith groups. They'd leave all that. Uh, uh, if he wasn't there, it wouldn't. They they could just pretend it never happened. So why don't they but, just well, ignore him? They can't, they can't ignore him because of that platform, because of who he is. And they, they, they need to sort of try and demonise him and drive a wedge between their readers. So they genuinely and, want a country in which nobody with a platform, a noticeable profile, can mm, publicly criticise politicians that they support. That's what they actually yeah, dream of. so popular, yeah. So, and, and, yeah. And, and, and I would add, I it right. does work. Yeah, it, does it does work. It does work. My own Daily Mail reading parents despise Gary Lineker now. Um, and you say and why? And they say? Up. And they say? Well, they they just moan and grumble and yeah. do a, a Jonathan Gullis. Um, <clears throat> uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and and I remember sat on the sofa cheering Gary Lineker's goals as, with, with my your dad. parents growing up. And now look at look at the difference now. It does, um, yeah. You, 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 you know, it's a timely reminder, Ian. Actually, um, that that, it, that of course it works. You can hear it not so much on this show anymore, but you can certainly hear it on other shows. People absolutely convinced that uh, Gary Lineker this and Gary Lineker that and Gary Lineker the other. And all you have to do is say, well, hang on a minute. You, you, you don't think he should be allowed any opinions at all on anything because he presents a football program on the BBC? That's a little bit fascistic, is it not? Just, or, or, oh, I see, just opinions you disagree with. So when a BBC presenter calls a Labour Prime Minister a one-eyed Scottish idiot, you're supremely comfortable with that, so comfortable, in fact, that if you had a radio show, you never would have mentioned it. But Gary Lineker, interesting. Uh, 12 noon. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is four minutes after 12. Do you know who else signed that letter that the Daily Mail is so cross about? Gary Lineker signing. Um, I, I don't know whether you'll find this easy or difficult to believe. The former head of the British Army, Richard Dannett. Well, General Sir Richard Dannett, to give him his, his full name. He said, The dogged pursuit of the unpopular plan to send people seeking protection to Rwanda is astonishing and described a failure to fully support Afghans fleeing the Taliban. 200 Afghans currently stuck in Pakistan uh, about to be deported and sent back to the uh, to the Taliban-run country of Afghanistan. Have you seen that story today? I don't know why the Daily Mail aren't getting cross about that, but that story is, is heartbreaking because these are 200 Afghans who were trained by and I think either, either helped or fought with um, British troops in Afghanistan. So you'd think they'd be queuing up, wouldn't you, to... Uh, well, I t- why can't they use all the safe and legal routes? No, 200 members of Afghan special forces trained and funded by the UK to fight against the Taliban face imminent deportation, deportation, that's the Tories' favourite word, to their Taliban-controlled homeland, the BBC reports today. 200. Another uh, general, Sir Richard Barons, on this occasion, served in Afghanistan over 12 years, told Newsnight it's a disgrace because it reflects that either we're duplicitous as a nation or incompetent. Duplicitous or incompetent. That's us. That's broken Britain. 
That's Boris Johnson's Brexit blighty. Duplicitous or incompetent? Why can't we look after people who are bona fidely? We do safe and legal. Uh, 200 members of Afghan special forces trained and funded by the UK to fight against the Taliban face imminent deportation to their Taliban-controlled homeland. Why can't they come here? Because there aren't any safe and legal routes. And if they managed to get here via unsafe routes and turned up in a dinghy, they'd be deported to Rwanda. Well, in Suella Braverman's fever dreams, they would be deported to Rwanda. That's the Afghan special forces trained and funded by the UK. Doesn't matter whether their application is sound or not, remember. They're going to be deported first and have the application processed second. And if the application is successful, if it turns out they really do need asylum, then they would, under the government's current proposals, stay in Rwanda for the rest of their lives. 200 members of Afghan special forces trained and funded by the UK. Pakistan is currently chucking out thousands and thousands and thousands of people for their own domestic political reasons. But you'd have thought that special forces trained and funded by the UK might constitute a special case. No doubt the new Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, will be talking about that imminently. Oh, it was a nice bit of good news on Sangeeta's show yesterday when... um, Sebastian Lai, whose campaign on behalf of his father, Jimmy, we've been following quite closely, has now been uh, uh, told that the Foreign Secretary, or at least representatives of the government, will meet him as he tries to get them to condemn the continued imprisonment of his British citizen father, Jimmy Lai, whose crime was to publish newspapers and then return to Hong Kong knowing the, of the threat to his liberty. So I, I, if you missed that with um, Sangeeta, quick heads up there. You can see more details on her Twitter account. Anyway, enough about Gary Lineker. Let's talk about Carol Ford. No, I'm joking. Let's talk about Rishi Sunak. Just listen to this first, and then we're going to have what might be a very short conversation, but which I hope is at least 52 minutes long. You don't now have access to any of the WhatsApps that you did send during the time of the crisis, do you? No, the, uh, I don't. I've changed my phone multiple times over the past few years, and as that has happened, the messages have not come across. As you said, I'm not a prolific user of WhatsApp in the first instance, primarily communication with my private office, and obviously anything that was of significance through those conversations or exchanges will have been recorded officially by my civil servants, as one would expect. Evidence has been given to the inquiry to the effect that Mr Johnson announced the institution of this inquiry in May 2021. And around that time, officials discussed the need for ministers and others to retain WhatsApps. It was a matter of um, debate, in fact, in WhatsApp communications between officials themselves. Um, Around that time, April and May 2021, did nobody nobody say to you, uh, Chancellor, it's important that you do retain your WhatsApps or we need to put into place measures for them to be backed up in case they, are, they become relevant to an inquiry. No, I, I don't recall either of those conversations that you referred to between officials, but you might have been referring to officials in number 10 rather yes. than the Treasury. And I, yes, and I don't recall anyone in my office uh, making that uh, recommendation or uh, observation to me at the time. Do you happen to recall, it's probably quite a long shot, but do you recall changing phones around that time as it happened? Not, not around that time, as I said. I have changed my phone multiple times in the, in the years since then. And um, as I said previously, every time that's happened, the messages uh, wouldn't have come across. Uh, but as I said, I'm not a prolific user of WhatsApp. And with the private office, again, that would have all been recorded formally on the record or indeed where I've had exchanges with other individuals, some of those have been part of the evidence that's formed the inquiry's deliberations. Um, Chinny Reckon, no? Or is that childish? Well, obviously Chinny Reckon is childish. Do you know what Chinny Reckon means, or are you too young? Chinny Reckon is, you used to do this to your chin. Why am I saying this? You can only see this if you're watching it later on YouTube. You'd, you'd stroke your chin. It's a sign of uh, scepticism. You don't believe something. You go, oh, yeah, Chinny Reckon. Or depending on where you grew up in the country, you might go, oh, Jimmy Hill, because Jimmy Hill, uh, a football pundit, uh, renowned for his rather splendid chin. So because Jimmy Hill had quite a big chin, he became a synonym for Chinny Reckon, Chinny Reckon itself being a chin-stroking expression of scepticism. What did they call it where you grew up? Don't ring in on this, by the way. What did they call it when you grew up? 
Do not have chinny reckon. Chinny chin chin. Chinny chin chin. By the hairs on my chin. Chin chinny chin chin chin. Chinny reckon. So someone says something you don't think it's true. You go chinny reckon. And obviously, if you're being very subtle and trying to make your mates laugh, you just stroke your chin in a slightly subtle... Mm. Of course, so, so if one of your mates is banging on about how successful he is with the ladies or what he did last Saturday night, and you know that he's talking twaddle, then you might just stroke your chin. Go, oh, really, mate? Yeah, that's interesting. Of course she did. Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, absolutely. So chinny reckon. But I still have... This is a bit like talking about the slimy dishonesty of Grant Shapps. I, 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 I don't know that I do want to stop expecting better of our politicians because if you stop expecting better of our politicians you almost give permission to the awful ones america or, or the right in america the republican party in america and much of the public they've stopped expecting better and donald trump is now ahead in the polls against joe biden just reflect for a moment on how terrifying that is because even if you think it's great news you're saying i don't care about the truth or all i care about is whatever it is that he, he represents to you or offers to you, because it's not the truth. Lying doesn't matter. So you have to expect better. You have to believe that the office of the President of the United States of America will return to the sort of expectations it had when Richard Nixon was drummed out of office or the reputation it enjoyed when people like Barack Obama were in the Oval Office. Or, or, I mean, Joe Biden is a, is a, is a good man, but the um, threat that Donald Trump poses to democracy is one that Joe Biden doesn't seem to be fully equipped to resist. So that idea that we should expect more from our politicians leads me to believe stroke hope that Rishi Sunak might be telling the truth, right? Even though I started with a chin, chinny reckon. Uh, itchy chin, itchy chin in Selby, it was. Uh, itch chin, uh, chinny bobs for us, says Jane. Uh, chinny bolero, where uh, Paul grew up in Lincoln. I quite like that, chinny bolero. Uh, and quite a few more, Jimmy Hill or just the beard, says Dave. Um, and we used to say chinny in the fens. That's enough chins now, thank you very much. Itchy beard, last one from Bromsgrove. So I... Yeah, I, do, I don't apologise for this, and I do want to stay the same. I want to be a person who thinks that a Prime Minister would not tell rather obvious fibs about his WhatsApp messages. Do you think he's telling the truth? 03456060973. Drawing upon, bearing in mind, you know, he was the holder of one of the highest offices in the land. He was... Chancellor of the Exchequer, he could have asked his neighbour, Boris Johnson, for help with his WhatsApp because Boris Johnson famously had technology lessons from Jennifer R. Curie. So Boris Johnson has lost his WhatsApp messages and Rishi Sunak has lost his WhatsApp messages. As far as I'm aware, every single other witness called by the inquiry has been able to produce their WhatsApp messages. That includes Simon Case, the cabinet secretary, who is too poorly even to give evidence. We wish him a speedy recovery. But the idea that the two... Because as I say these words out loud, it feels quite important to me that the two most senior generals during this period of unprecedented national peril have somehow both managed to lose their communications with each other and with others both of them i mean one looks like an accident what the hell does i'm thinking of uh lady bracknell's handbag now two looks like to lose one child or oh, i forget exactly what the line is one looks like a misfortune right two looks like a conspiracy the two most senior members of the government during a time, during a period of absolutely unprecedented national peril, a man who, of course, prides himself on his facility with San Francisco tech culture, who prostrated himself, metaphorically speaking, at the feet of the ogre Elon Musk not long ago for reasons that remain absolutely impenetrable to me and you and anybody else paying attention, probably him in retrospect, the idea that Rishi Sunak, wannabe tech bro and almost a billionaire, 
would be defeated by the complexities of keeping WhatsApp messages seems to me to be a little bit chinny reckon. But I want it to be true because the alternative is horrible. The alternative is bleak. The alternative, in Johnson's case, is very easy to believe. Boris Johnson claimed he'd lost his WhatsApp messages, but he was claiming 10 minutes ago that he couldn't remember who paid for the refurbishment of his own flat until the WhatsApp messages turned up. And his then, uh, was it his cabinet secretary or his ethics advisor? I think it was his ethics advisor. It was one of the things that contributed to his decision to resign. That was Boris Johnson's ethics, second ethics advisor. The first one resigned in protest over Boris Johnson's complete lack of ethics regarding Pretty Patel being a bully. How, well, first of all, do you think he's telling the truth? And then second of all, drawing on your tech expertise, is it is it feasible that his WhatsApp messages would be completely, I like this word, I think I might have just invented it, irretrievable. Is that a word? Irretrievable? Jolly well should be. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 973. And I don't have a question on this big issue. I mean, how significant is it? I don't know. What's the? But Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak both claiming that they have mysteriously and unintentionally mislaid their private communications with each other and senior colleagues. I am actually just going to ask you whether you buy it. And if not, why not? It's 12.17. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 20 minutes after 12. Um, Nicola Sturgeon had questions to answer as well, didn't she, on this? Um, uh, Refusing to confirm or deny the allegations that she deleted some or all of her WhatsApp messages during the COVID pandemic. Her successor as First Minister, Humza Yusuf, actually added to pressure on Sturgeon by saying publicly he'd kept all his WhatsApp messages and was providing them to the UK inquiry. But the question of whether or not you can accidentally lose them I I can see how you could deliberately lose them, but Sunak and Johnson both claiming that they accidentally lost them. What do we think of that? Susan's in Croydon. Susan, what do you think? Well, let's let's put aside the fact that Boris Johnson is a proven multiple times liar. Okay. And let's put aside the fact that Richard Sunak plays fast and loose with the truth. Okay. And let's just deal with the fact that it is really... It, I, I'm not a technophobe. I'm sorry, I am a technophobe. I don't like technology and that I'll sort of thing. Make your mind up. But... <laughs> I, I'm not particularly tech savvy, yeah. Um, but I have changed my phone multiple times during the same period, and at no time did I actually lose any of my messages. Really? So you just, you just you just you just you put your swap your SIM card, turned it on, and you logged like on to app. downloaded app, WhatsApp, you know, the, the, and it was there. And it was there, and it was really. I mean, I took to to, to be doubly sure. Yeah, because mm. I didn't want to lose my messages. I actually, I, you know, I knew it was simple, but because I, I actually just changed my phone in September, and I went into Curry's, got my phone, and I said, "Guys, can you just help me do this?" And it looked, took an hour, you know, just the time going over half an hour to an hour, mm. and it was literally press this button, press that button, boom, it was all there. So it's really simple. And you're telling me that the the prime minister and the chancellor of the exchequer can't do that with all of the resources at their their disposal. So in my view, the only way that you could lose your WhatsApp messages is if you actively did something to do that. And I think they have the incentive. You know, if you think about like a trial, you know, what's their motive? Well, their motive is hiding the things they don't want to get out. So for example... the stuff that has got out is bad enough. But we we are being asked to believe that of all the people required to give evidence to the COVID inquiry, the only two who have accidentally lost tranches of whatsapp exchanges from the earliest days of this period of unprecedented national peril were the two people in charge of everything exactly so it, it's not credible it's not credible they've mm. treated us they, they've treated us like they, they've basically treated with the british public um with contempt by telling us oh no there were no parties we didn't have any parties yeah and they yeah. said that with the same straight face that they're telling us that they oh accidentally lost their messages there's just no way it's not credible I, I don't, yes, I'm not I am sure. calling I, each of them a liar. I, I, well, good luck. I, well, well, I'd say good luck. I mean, it's perfectly reasonable, um, given the evidence that you've provided. But as you say, you are a technophobe, and therefore perhaps somebody a little bit more technophile can fill us in on how plausible it is. Because, you know, look, coincidences happen. They do exist. The greatest detectives, of course, never trust them. 
But they do they do occur, and the two men, most senior officially, because of course Dominic Cummings was unofficially, I think, more powerful than either of them. But he's he's fronted up all his WhatsApp messages. I read a bit, they were very fruity, read a bit like Viz comic in places. He used so much foul language. But the idea that the two people in charge during a period of unprecedented national peril have both mysteriously managed to lose their WhatsApp messages. What do you reckon? Dames is in Holmes. See, I just mentioned detective. He's in Holmes Chapel. What would you like to say, David? Da- Daniel? Sorry? Daniel. Daniel? <laughs> Hi, James. How are you doing? Okay, well, Daniel. Yeah. Good. Yeah, Daniel. Excellent. Got it. That's okay. Um, so I, I can sort of, I've switched my phones a few times uh, yeah. over the past few years, and I can sort of fairly definitively tell you what happens when you when you switch your phone. So if you go from an iPhone to an iPhone, yeah, um, it prompts you to say, do you want to restore your messages from iCloud? Yeah. Um, now, that's also true on Android. If you go from an Android to an Android, you get the option to restore your messages from Google Drive. Yeah. Now, up until about six months ago, though, if you were going from an iPhone to an Android or an Android to an iPhone, actually, you couldn't transfer your messages. So it is plausible okay. as the one who switched their phone. But if I've, got, I've still got my yeah. old phone. Yes. So I was going to come on to that. So if say Rishi's gone from a, an Android phone to an iPhone, um, if he really wanted to get those messages, he'd just need to get any Android phone, log into his WhatsApp on there, and he'd be able to download them from Google Drive. And what about on your computer? Can you not, because I've got WhatsApp, it has to be near my phone, doesn't it, WhatsApp to work? So if I change phone and go yeah. back to my laptop and go on WhatsApp yeah. on my laptop, am I? what am I going to get then? So if... If if you've gone from iPhone to iPhone and it and it's backed up from yeah. it, it's backed up from iCloud, it, it'll all be there. Uh, but I'll say That's up until thought. recently, there's no you, way you, he's he's, yeah. he's iPhone so, to iPhone all day long, isn't he? Don't you think? <laughs> no, look at him. I would, I do, he does seem like an iPhone man. I bet he's bad. got the watch as well, mate. I bet <laughs> Probably, he's got the watch as well. And of course, if you've got the watch, then it doesn't matter if you change phone. But, well, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> um, but the the point is, I mean, I suppose really is that you can. You can opt out of that, so yeah. it will it will back up by automatically to, to either iCloud or Google Drive. But you can go and switch yeah, that off. But there's, I mean, here there's a quick there's a quick one two of questions here that you ask yeah. yourself as Chancellor of the Exchequer during a yeah. period of unprecedented national peril. When you see the prompt asking you if you want to save messages that will detail the exchanges you were having with your closest colleagues well, in government, you'd say, well, God exactly. yes, God yes, yes. unless. Unless, yeah, being, being Unless called, you didn't want them back up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, liar, liar, pants on fire is actually a worse yeah. prospect than the messages coming out. So the trade-off is between a country thinking that you're blowing smoke up their backside or mm-hmm. the messages being retained and released. Yeah, so ultimately, if you're tech literate and you've lost your WhatsApp messages, you've done that on purpose, as far as I'm concerned. It's not looking good for him, is it? 27 no. minutes after 12. Thank you, Daniel. Rob's in Leeds. Rob, what do you reckon? Hi, James. Hello. Um, yeah, a couple of things I want to say, really. Take your uh, time. Chimmy Reckon. Chimmy uh, Reckon. Ch- Chinny Raccoon. Chinny Raccoon. Oh, I like that. Chinny Raccoon. Ah, yes, carry on. Chinny Hill. Chinny Hill. Um, chin chimmery churu. Chim chim churu. Chin chin churu. Chin chinany chin chinany chin chin churu. Yes, mate. He's is that it? Is backside. that it, Rob? Is that it? Have we... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, they're the ones that I can remember from the Fair good old enough. days of the playground, Indeed, mate. Yeah, um, yeah in, in Leeds. Yeah, he's, he's just lying out of his backside. That's all it is. And yeah, because the calculation is, what's worse, everyone thinking I'm a big fat liar, or the message is being retained and released? Yeah. Well, you see the incompetence or, you know, the only thing you could... If, if you'd you do if it. You, you'd transfer it. You'd Everyone transfers it. You could lose anything. You could, you know... I, I some, I'm very bad at transferring things to my contacts, so I need to get in touch with someone. I go back to my messages and find the message in which they gave me their email or they gave me their phone number. Obviously, you, you, we can't, you know, the, the whole thing, you can't prove what's in someone's head. So if, well, they could back believe, to that again. if they believe that that's what they're saying, you can't prove that they're, that they're lying. But as, as anecdotal evidence from myself, I've, I've changed my phone every year or every 18 months mm, you know, when you. my contract's up yeah. since, you know, um, you know, since I've had... 1971. You know, I, well, yeah, pretty much going back nearly 20 years. Yeah. 
I've had WhatsApp since 2017, right. and I have act- actively never clicked the backup. You know, every okay. now and again, you, you get the pop-up message saying, you know, choose when to back up your, yeah, your yeah. messages daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. And I just click never because I think, you know, I, yeah, I've, I've got nothing short. to store. I've yeah. got nothing to yeah, save. I can go into my WhatsApp, go on my archived messages, everything. I've got messages going back to the start of 2017, so which I. I haven't looked at in, you know, well, since 2017. Well, so have I here. Yeah. And I, I've changed you know, my phone since 2017. Unless you physically swipe it to delete it. I have never consciously done anything to keep them. No. Do you know the first thing I was invited to do on... Uh, I can't. Can I share this on air? Yeah, I can. Well, you can tell me off air. Uh, no, I'll tell you now. So the first thing on my WhatsApp, I've just gone back to December 2016, actually, and a colleague created a group called LBC Presenters Banter. <laughs> and the first yeah. message I got is, Nigel is now added. So I left the group, and so it just says, you left. That's it. That's my first ever interaction on WhatsApp going back. I won't tell you who the colleague was that set up the group. But I never, oh. I never replied to it. So 20th of December, 2016, created this group. I never went near it. 13th of July, 2017, so-and-so added you. So I, I got added six months later. And then the next day, Nigel is now added to this. Nigel is now on WhatsApp, so I have added him. And I just pressed leave group straight away. But, but it's still there. It's December 2016, mate. That's seven years ago, to the day almost. And I've still yep. got it all. So what's he? What's he? What's he on about? What's he on about, Rob? What's he on about? Amelia Cox has got your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's twelve thirty-four. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I should explain that if you are watching this on YouTube, I was just describing the new rotisserie function on my new oven to the producer because you may have been wondering what on earth I was just doing with that. I keep forgetting that I am filmed all the time and sometimes I'm still being filmed when we play clips especially if they're only audio clips as opposed to video clips so there was one occasion last week where lip readers would have had a field day on what I was saying while Boris Johnson was giving some of his evidence to the COVID inquiry I mentioned this partly by way of a heads up if you are going to be following events on the YouTube channel and partly to warn Charlotte Lynch that she too is currently on camera as she prepares to talk us through Rishi Sunak's evidence to the said COVID inquiry. Thank you very much, James. Um, The WhatsApp messages that we've been discussing was the first thing that that he was asked about, of course, Rishi Sunak um, saying that he changed his phone so many times, uh, has changed his phone so many times since then, of course, he's since become prime minister, um, that they are irretrievable and nobody told him at the time that he should probably keep them because uh, some of the most crucial decisions ever made in the history of this country were were being taken uh, as we have seen throughout this inquiry uh, and a lot of the time discussed uh, on WhatsApp. Um, But he began his evidence uh, with an apology uh, to families who lost loved ones during the pandemic. Thank you Mr Keith. Yes, uh, thank you for having me here today. I just wanted to start by saying how deeply sorry I am to all of those who lost loved ones, family members through the pandemic, and also all those who suffered uh, in the various different ways throughout the pandemic and as a result of the actions were taken. I've thought a lot about this over the past couple of years. It's important that we learn the lessons so that we can be better prepared in the future. And it's in that spirit and with enormous respect for all of those who are affected that I'm here today. And I look forward to giving evidence in a spirit of constructive candour to help the inquiry with its deliberations. Now, he's being asked so far about the decisions that were taken in the early days of the pandemic, March 2020, um, saying that he saw Boris Johnson during that time more than his own wife, as he's surprisingly, I think, uh, defended the the Prime Minister's approach and uh, the government uh, around him. Um, He's been given ample opportunity to to criticise or even, you know, just just slightly um, give his own impression of Boris Johnson's administration, the people around him. Um, But all he's been saying is, you know, all I know is that I was given 
really good opportunities to provide my advice, as was my job as Chancellor, present the economic arguments uh, for and against certain measures that were being taken. I had good access to the Prime Minister um, and I went away and did my job and didn't see any of that. Hugo Keith Casey then put it directly to him uh, about the evidence that's been given during the inquiry uh, that there was this toxic culture within Downing Street. Were you aware that his closest advisers had seemingly unanimously taken the view that there was a, a lack of efficiency. Um, the administration described privately as brutal and useless or criminally incompetent or operationally chaotic. Was any of that known to you? Uh, no, I don't think any of those uh, comments were, were shared with me at the time. You, you made a point though, Mr Keith, is that debates raged. Um, I don't think that that is necessarily a bad thing. No, indeed I mean, these, 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 it's right that there was vigorous debate because these were incredibly consequential decisions. I could play you um, several different clips, James, and they'd all sound pretty similar to that, mm. to be honest, because this is the approach that, that he is taking uh, throughout. Nothing he, to see here. No, exactly. He personally felt that he had the opportunity to feed into that decision-making in uh, Boris Johnson's government, that it was an unpredictable situation, that things were happening uh, so quickly. Um, and there was good debate and, and discussion as it went along, as should have rightly been. Um, but as you say, nothing to see here. He has just been asked about the meeting that took place, the cabinet meeting that took place, in which that first lockdown in March 2020 uh, was decided upon. Um, and I'll, I'll just let you hear the clip. Here's what mm. he had to say when he was asked about that meeting. This was, of course, one of the most momentous decisions in the history of this nation. A great deal of water was passed under mm. the bridge. The decision taken at that 5 p.m. meeting on, on what date, when you say on the Monday, 5 p.m. meeting, what date? Monday, the 23rd of March, the decision to impose a mandatory stay-at-home order followed by the Prime Ministerial announcement and then the Cabinet meeting the following day. It all revolved around that decision. My suggestion to you is that debate just didn't take place, or if it did, it didn't take place to the degree to which it should. Yeah, I can't precisely recall that particular meeting, but uh, as I said, the track record of all those meetings, 16th, 18th, 19th, or 20th and, and 23rd, was the government following the scientific advice that was put in front of it. So Rishi Sunak there claiming he can't remember the meeting uh, on the 23rd of March where the government decided, yes, we're going to lock the country down and impose this mandatory um, stay at home order. But you heard him say at the end there, um, we, we just took the scientific advice. He actually said uh, that it was SAGE that kept changing its mind, not the government. This characterisation that the government flip flopped and went back and forth. He actually has insisted every government decision during that time was guided by the scientific advice. And when they changed their advice, the government acted. That's why he said schools weren't closed until the 16th of March and mass gatherings like the Cheltenham races, the Cheltenham mm. Festival still went ahead, but said if, if Sage had advised it, then they would have stopped it. But like I say, it's this approach that we just did what the scientists were telling us to do. Um, I was just doing my job as, as chancellor and I had good communication uh, with the prime minister and I don't know about anything else. Interesting. I wonder how much... Uh conversation there has been between Johnson, Sunak and Hancock because they're singing from very similar hymn sheets, aren't they? And very different hymn sheets from the ones that everybody else is singing from, whether it's Dominic Cummings or, or Patrick Valance or well, we're not going to hear from Simon Case, but the messages that he was very, so it's a great shame. We do wish him a speedy recovery, too poorly to give evidence. And he was the cabinet secretary descri describing the mess in Downing Street as being absolutely unbearable, incomprehensibly awful and something with which he considered himself unable to, to put up with for much longer. Um, it counter, what was it? Accountability, professionalism and integrity. That he said would be at the heart of his government, yet when he became Prime Minister. And he, the same man, is now asking us to believe that not a single WhatsApp message that he sent during COVID was pertinent enough for him to have formally retained it for the public record. Or retrievable on any of his phones that he uh, has had since then. Was it a different Rishi Sunak who spent millions of pounds of public money in the High Court to prevent the release of the messages that he now says don't exist? That did happen. That did happen. 
And that was a decision taken by the inquiry, an unprecedented decision to, for, by an inquiry, a, a state instituted, a government instituted inquiry to take a government, the, the same government effectively, to court because they weren't handing over details um, that they felt they should decide what was relevant and what was not, whereas Hugo Keith Casey and, 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 and Baroness Hallett thought they should decide what is relevant to the inquiry we are conducting. So the stuff that they went to court to get has now disappeared, it would seem. Charlotte Lynch, thank you. I'll play you that clip again about the WhatsApp messages because I'm not sure Chinny Reckon goes far enough. You don't now have access to any of the WhatsApps that you did send during the time of the crisis, do you? No, the, uh, I don't. I've changed my phone multiple times over the past few years and as that has happened, the messages have not come across. As you said, I'm not a prolific user of WhatsApp in the first instance, primarily communication with my private office and obviously anything that was of significance through those conversations or exchanges will have been recorded officially by my civil servants as one would expect. Evidence has been given to the inquiry to the effect that Mr Johnson announced the institution of this inquiry in May 2021 and around that time officials discussed the need for ministers and others to retain WhatsApps. It was a matter of um, debate, in fact, in WhatsApp communications between officials themselves. Um, around that time, April and May 2021, did nobody, nobody say to you, uh, Chancellor, it's important that you do retain your WhatsApps or we need to put into place measures for them to be backed up in case they, are, they become relevant to an inquiry? No, I, I don't recall either those conversations that you referred to between officials, but you might have been referring to officials in number 10 rather than yes. the, the Treasury. And I, yes, and I don't recall anyone in my office uh, making that uh, recommendation or uh, observation to me at the time. Do you happen to recall, it's probably quite a long shot, but do you recall changing phones around that time as it happened? Not, not around that time, as I said. I have changed my phone multiple times in the, in the years since then. And um, as I said previously, every time that's happened, the messages uh, wouldn't have come across. Uh, but as I said, I'm not a prolific user of WhatsApp. And with the private office, again, that would have all been recorded formally on the record. Or indeed, where I've had exchanges with other individuals, some of those have been part of the evidence that's formed the inquiry's deliberations. I, I don't know how many times I can sit here and say to you, why why is this not being treated with the same level of importance that we feel it should be? But um, but that's what I'm thinking. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.48. I'm just checking the timeline. It was in July of 2023. So this year, that Rishi Sunak's government lost legal action over the COVID inquiry. The, the Cabinet Office launched legal action, so that would have been under Simon Case's watch. Simon Case, sadly, too poorly to give evidence. We wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, uh, legal action over Baroness Hallett's order to release the former Prime Minister's documents. Um, and they lost that case. Johnson's unredacted WhatsApp messages, notebooks and diaries. And that would have included Sunak's as well. So anything that they hadn't handed over, they were being ordered to hand over. The, the, the central bone of contention was that they should decide, Sunak and Johnson should decide, what was relevant to the inquiry and what was not. So Boris Johnson's defence effectively was saying, trust me, folks. I, you know, the bloke that said there weren't any parties and then said there were parties, but he didn't know anything about them, and then said there were parties and he did know about them, but he definitely didn't go to them, and then said that there were parties and he did know about them and he did actually go to them, and then said he hadn't lied about it to the House of Commons, but was found by a jury of his peers in the House of Commons to have lied to the House of Commons. That fella there, the one who lied about knowing whether or not Chris Pincher was a sex pest before appointing Chris Pincher deputy chief whip. That guy, yeah, he said, trust me on this. I'll decide what's relevant and what is not. And they lost that case in July of this year. In October of this year, Rishi Sunak, it was reported, hadn't handed over any WhatsApp messages at all from his time as Chancellor. And yet, because he said he'd changed phones several times and failed to back them up. And yet I am mildly confident that I 
have never consciously backed anything up on my phone, which I've definitely changed a few times since 2016. And I can find messages on my WhatsApp from 2016 when I didn't even really use it. 12.50 is the time. So what do you think's going on here? David's in Aberdeen. David, what would you like to say? Good afternoon, James. Well, I started off with one. I started off with one point, and, mm. and sort of, I'm, I'm going to go into another in a minute, which is quite important. But fantastic. Just on a sheer technical level, yes. in my my understanding of WhatsApp, it's linked to your number, not to your phone. Yes, of course. So if you stop using that number, even you know, if you, if it, and my other understanding is it that that number has to be connected to the network for yes. WhatsApp to work at all, even on WhatsApp web on your on yes. browser. So. Uh, I could sort of understand, possibly, if you ditch your number completely, how all those associated messages might disappear. But that's people. easily checked, isn't it? He hasn't claimed he's changed his number, and that would be very, very easily well, checked by any has, any any lobby journalist in the in the country. I think he has claimed to change his number because wasn't it the case that his number was public knowledge and he was obliged? That to was change Boris his Johnson. Number? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. I beg your yeah. pardon. I thought you were talking, talking about, about Rishi Sunak. Yeah. No, no. Uh, yeah, I can understand that because I've come in part way through the conversation. No, I know it's fine. about Rishi. I know it's about Sunak's evidence today. Johnson, I could, I could sort of get that. Oh, look, I'm not his defender here. In right. fact, what I want to know is, I was a civil servant during all this time during oh, yeah. the COVID period. I retired last year. We, as civil servants, were issued with government equipment. That's a, a PC or you know a, a computer and a government phone. And we were only allowed to communicate via those government devices, and we could not install any non-government software on anything, on the laptop or on the phone. So my, my question is, it's I haven't heard anybody it? ask yet, yeah. why were they using WhatsApp in the first place, yeah. and on what device? Yeah. It's the equivalent of using your private email for government business. Which is and a breach of the such. ministerial code. But, uh, but I don't Absolutely. think the code has, taught, has caught up with the technology. Just to go back to your first point... Uh, it mm. was reported in July of this year. Boris Johnson has vowed to pass his pandemic WhatsApp messages over to the COVID inquiry after experts managed to recover them from an old phone he had been advised not to use for security reasons. It's it, That's oh. the phone to which you refer. It's almost as if the story changes with the weather, oh, isn't it? It's just, yeah. If, if you're talking to somebody who's been fibbing, they just lurch from one fib to another. Mm. As part of my role, we had to conduct investigations into events. So I can't say which department I was in. Obviously, of course. But if people's stories, witnesses, were very, very, very similar, yeah. they were colluding. Yeah. We, you know, because you can f four people can witness something at close quarters, and you'll get four slightly varying or sometimes incredibly varying versions of what was said and what was done. Mm. When they start to match too closely... Of course, I mean, the police would be the same, wouldn't they? It's not, not, yes. not just civil servant inquiries, but also police investigations. It's all a little bit too pat, they would yes. say. Yes, you know, it, it is. And, and, and this is sort of, you know, the way it goes. But that was my point. No, really, it's James, a powerful point. Sort of, and, and, and the civil service once again like held that? to higher standards than the politicians who now dedicate a significant amount of time to slacking <laughs> off civil servants. The, the reason why we had to use government software and package was because it had to be auditable yeah. in the event of a freedom of information request. It's extraordinary. End of. It's a, a, no, I, I mean, you're you know you're right, I know you're right, and you both know, we both know that they're already... I, I read the mail on Sunday online yesterday, I saw someone on Twitter posting front pages claiming that Johnson and uh, was, was poised for a comeback, even possibly alongside Nigel Farage. And you just sort of think, how? I mean, it doesn't matter anymore, does it? It doesn't matter how much evidence there is of unsuitability or, 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 or awfulness. That, that process of footballification, which was still, uh, it turns out, relatively new when I coined the phrase, it's now gone so far that, that people's brains have turned to have turned to jelly. Speaking of people whose brains have turned to je jelly, the so-called star chamber, which is what Mark Francois calls um, his toilet, I think, the Tory right star chamber has concluded that the Rwanda bill provides a partial and incomplete solution to challenges in UK courts and is vulnerable to international law. What a beautiful turn of phrase they've deployed. It's vulnerable to international law. If you're thinking of going out robbing later, you're thinking of going out, I don't know, heading down to Selfridges or, or depending on where you are in the country, heading down to the local departments or the local electrical, your local curries or an Argos or something like that. You're going to head down there and help yourself to a PlayStation 5, for example, or a car, head down to the local park, car, car, forecourt. Do remember that your actions would be vulnerable to the law.
You may actually, you may, that you may be vulnerable to domestic law, but to thieving law, theft law, vulnerable to law. Turns out that the Rwanda bill is vulnerable to international law, i.e. it's probably breaking the law. And the Tory party in my lifetime was credibly considered to be the party of law and order, but not those laws. Thank you, David. Last word, perhaps, I don't know, might be time for one more, is to Adam in Greenwich. Adam, what, what's going on here? Hi, Jane. Hello, Adam. Yeah, so um, I'm a tech professional, so I just want to talk about the technicalities of actually receiving messages from WhatsApp very yeah. quickly. Um, so really, um, there's, as long as you keep the existing number or you change the number, it doesn't really matter as long as you've turned on backup. And so that's just that in your settings, is it? You just have that switched on in settings. Exactly. But so that's why I've done up, it without knowing or even intending to. Well, yes. When you first sign up for WhatsApp for the first time, when yeah. you first activate it, it asks you, do you want to back up? Yeah, and, and of course I do, because I'm a, you know, a high-powered, important media professional, <laughs> and who knows what communications I may need to refer back to at some point in the future. It, it, exactly. And it doesn't matter whether it's an iOS or an Android transfer, as long as you want to. So if you get a new number, you literally have to click transfer my number, and it says, which we come back up to do, and it transfers. But I think that, my personal opinion is that this is by design. I think that civil servants, uh, not civil servants, but these government officials, MPs, are being told or have a understanding to not turn on backup exactly for these situations. I think it's exactly well, it's, no, but it's only Johnson and Sunak who have lost them. Everyone else has got them backed up. That's, that's a very fair point, but we, we do need to consider in this situation, right? I mean, And Sunak's lost a lot, as far as I can tell. Johnson only lost bits from the early months and then claimed that they were going to be retrievable, but then, lo and behold, they didn't turn up anyway. And Sunak's yeah government took the decision to take the inquiry to court in order to refuse to hand over things that they now claim they didn't have in the first place it's a bit of a waste yeah. of money isn't it well yeah but i do think like you can still access a a previous number in two ways if Go you on. still have the physical device yes. if you still have the device yes and that number has not been activated by someone else which it won't have been in such a short period of time they wouldn't exactly. have they wouldn't have divvied yeah. it up to someone else imagine answering the phone like auntie yeah. doris picks up the phone and it's got all rishi sunak <laughs> what's that message is that be a tale to tell exactly uh, so, so, in that so what do you think's the happened then chinny reckon or, or 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 deliberate deception not deception deliberate uh, cover-up I don't think it's necessarily just about the COVID inquiry. I think there is a common understanding amongst a group of individuals within government and parliament who actively uses WhatsApp and turns off backups and uses... The so they're using it as a sort of back channel, and that, that is actually against all the rules, um, whether you're a civil servant or a politician. Adam, perfect last word on that. I'm just going to have a fight with Lynn in Cambridgeshire, who's texted to say, you don't know how Argos works then. I do know how Argos works, Lynn in Cambridgeshire. And when I said someone was going to go down and rob it, I meant they were going to go backstage behind the tills and help themselves to goods from the warehouse. I know it's not a normal shop like, like what, well, you know... Curries is or something. But the point is this, Lynn in Cambridgeshire. If you are going to go and rob Argos later today, be aware that you, your behaviour will be vulnerable to the law, which is the phrase that Marc Francois's funny little outfit has used to describe the Rwanda bill in the context of international law. It's vulnerable to the law, which is a euphemism for saying it probably breaks it. If you missed any of today's show, bad luck. We've not backed any of it up. It's impossible. We just can't get across the technology. Um, I, I, I beg your pardon. I've been misinformed. You can listen back to the whole show podcast on Global Player, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. All our shows are there, as well as the world's biggest podcasts. Pause and rewind live radio on Global Player, where you're always in control. Download it for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick. But now, it's Sheila Fogarty. Hello, hello. Hello, um, hello. James O'Brien on LBC. 